appropriations. And as always, just when I think we're getting our list of things to do at a smaller amount, more things pile on. So we're gonna have to figure out our timeline. But first we have Michael Grady here from Legislative Council. And Mike, thank you for coming back Biz. we went through the um, House Ag Bill with you and you got through the whole bill, but we really didn't have enough time to ask questions. And in particular, we wanted to continue the conversation around uh, those, those entities receiving grants or individuals receiving grants if they uh, were not current with their taxes or current with child support. And you said more, um, you've had more um, information and development on this. So can we start with that piece, Mike, and then we'll go to the bill, please? Sure, so just to refresh your memory, uh, all state grants are subject to Administrative Bulletin 5, which has mandatory terms and conditions. And uh, two of those are that the applicant certifies that they're in good standing uh, with payment of taxes and good standing with payment of their child support. Uh, if they're not, uh, the terms and conditions allow the granting entity to withhold payment. Uh, so there was some concern that was raised um, from the farming community actually about the tax provision. Uh, I talked to you about it yesterday and whether or not it was a discussion with you um, or uh, side conversations. This morning, Diane Bothfeld at the Agency of Agriculture emailed Senator Hardy and said for the CARES Act money going out through ACCD, the Department of Tax, and the Agency of Agriculture, there will be no reduction in the funding to individuals and businesses due to tax and or child support issues. Uh, and that's something that the Secretary of Administration has authority to do under Administrative Bulletin 5 is to waive any of the mandatory terms and conditions. And apparently they have done that. So that, that issue uh, should no longer be an issue based on this email. Any questions on that topic uh, for Mike? It looks it looks like it's been handled, Diane. Does, the, I just, Mike, thank you, thank you so much for that. So, does that mean all of the CRF dollars, or just this ag piece? You said it was from Diane. Well, it, it what is referenced is the ACCD money, the depart tax department, and the Agency of Agriculture. I am sure there are other CRF funds. Um, but I can follow up with uh, who has been your point person from the administration on this? Is it is it Commissioner Gresham? Um, uh, yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And so I, I can follow up with Adam and um, see if this is going to flow through for all of the CRF grant programs. We haven't had this particular conversation with Adam, but as far as Sierra funding and other pieces of the budget, Adam has been the point person. Okay. Thank you, Diane. Uh, Marty? Yeah, I would wanna make sure that it does flow through through all of them because within the budget, for instance, there's a lot of financial aid money going out to persons, either through UVM or VSC or VSAC, those people might be affected by um, the not in good standing. Uh, there's also money going out through the Department of Public Service on, on the technology pieces. And there's money going out through AHS through uh, many of the housing things. So I think we need to make sure that or find out if it can be a an exemption made to anything using the CRF funding. I will find out. And then Mike, if, if language needs to go in and then be reflected in all those bills that have already moved, you will provide language to us that we would put in one of our bills that would then get reflected into all the pieces. How do we do that? Uh, sure, I've, I've already drafted language for the agriculture assistance bill because the Senate committee wanted it. Um, they wanted to be, they weren't, didn't want to wait for a, a, a CRF wide decision. They built it into their bill. I can just take that language and, and um, build it into the template that's being used for these CRF bills. Okay. 
And for the bills that have already left and the governor has signed, though, like in the BAA, if there were, happened to be an, because some CRF money's gone out all over the place, how do we how do we reflect it into those that have already been signed into law? Um, I think you just need to choose one of the bills to include a provision that says that any CRF funds, the uh, notwithstanding the law or administrative bulletin five, the provisions on um, tax set off and reduction for failure to pay taxes or child support shall not apply. It, it should only be about three or four lines long. So um, the best place to put it would be the quarter bill that the Senate is on the floor now with, which would, would be tricky to do. It would have the same effect if we throw it in the economic development bill tomorrow morning or in Mike Marcotte's committee. Uh, yeah, it's just about the scope of it. Um, okay. it's, it's really, you just, for any CRF funds appropriated in fiscal year 21 or, when, or appropriated from the CRF, however you want to phrase it. Okay, Maria, will you make sure, I, I don't know if it's you, Maria, but to make sure that we have that tomorrow from Mike to drop in so that Mike, he's, he's in a lot of committees, if we could have that okay. line drop in. Does, it, does that make sense to the committee before I go ahead and ask to do it? Is that the bill? I think that's the right bill because I don't want to mess with the Senate. I have a thumbs up from Peter. Do other people agree that we'd drop it in the economic development bill? the broad yeah. line yes okay but I, but I do think we we ought to just I mean Mike has it and we'll draft it but I, I think we just if Mike finds out that this waiver is sort of uh, whatever administration wide we don't need to do it right I mean if Mike finds out that the, that the waiver applies to all across you know it's not just ACCD Department of Ag, et cetera, then, then there's not really a need to do it, right? Well, except I think we want to make sure on the legislative side, the other branch of government. All right. As well as money going out for financial aid for UVM and BSC and VSAC. Those are not governmental agencies. Is that okay, Chip? I, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just, yeah, I just want to double do it, and, and as Marty said, there would be groups that wouldn't be covered. Good, okay, thank you. And um, I'll, let me get that on my list. So then Mike, um, um, were there any other questions regarding that? Um, I guess I'll write myself a note. Um, uh, I'm sorry. The next thing, um, let's just go to the larger agriculture bill. This is still under discussion between the two um, uh, committees of agriculture, House and Senate. Mike, do you wanna just give us the broad framework of a kind of, we don't know what the details are where they're going to land hopefully this afternoon, but can you give us some of the broad, frame it up for us, I guess. Sure. Uh Please. As you, just as a, a background, the, the Senate S-351 would create a dairy assistance program that would provide financial assistance to milk producers and dairy processors. It would also create an agricultural producer or processor program that would provide uh, assistance to non-dairy farmers, commercial processors, commercial slaughterhouses, and farmers markets. There is, um, as the Senate proposed, there would be $19 million appropriated for milk producers, 3.8 appropriated for dairy processors, and seven for those non-dairy ag producers and processors. <coughs> the House Committee on Agriculture um, originally felt that there should be no money appropriated to the non-dairy agricultural producers and processors and wanted to have all of the $30 million appropriated for the dairy assistance program <clears throat> with uh, basically um, like a 22-8 split. Um, but the Senate uh, Ag Committee this morning uh, insisted on having the non-dairy ag program. And now the conversation is about at what amount uh, that program would be funded. Excuse me, I need some water, I apologize. 
Um, the Senate this morning proposed moving the the non dairy program to a five million dollar amount, moving the dairy program to a twenty one million dollar amount, the milk producer program to a twenty one, and the dairy processor to three point eight. So a total of twenty four million eight hundred thousand would be appropriated to the dairy assistance program and a total of 5 million would be appropriated to an agricultural producer and processor program. There is an additional 192,000 that was in S351 that would be appropriated to BHCB uh, to um, help them pay for additional uh, staff and consultants to meet the, the exponential demand that they have on their surfaces since COVID. Um, and that's, really where they are the house chair was going to talk with her committee about the senate's proposal um they uh that's really uh basically what i can talk about right now thank you mike so that's the broad framework and where the details are uh, i mean the discussion that we would have now we don't have the details and we'll have to wait until it comes forth there is a piece, though, that I would like the committee to talk about. Uh, Chip has been working on a forestry piece. And um, so, so that um, I'd like to put that piece up so that when we do get the bill, we can at least have a section of it done because all of this is going to move very quickly tomorrow or maybe later this afternoon, which would be help us significantly. So um, Chip or Mike, who's, who's going to... Uh, Chip, uh Mike, I need you to walk through it, but Chip, why don't you just tell the committee how it came to be, please? Okay, um, and I did sort of go over this briefly with the committee um, the other day. Um, you know, the, um, there was not, the, the forest products industry or the um, forest economy is um, a really central part to um, the rural economy for many parts of this state. Um, uh, and and I think arguably essential to what a lot of us think about um, Vermont as a whole and the working landscape and, and the recreational landscape um, that we all value and that also brings a lot of tourists to Vermont to, um, to uh, support our economy. So um, there just, there didn't seem to be, there, there was a need for, um, let me back up, there was the forest products industry for reasons that I, I won't go into now, but I will um, happily provide and we'll talk about when I'm on the floor, um, really has suffered um, through this COVID crisis in part because of the lack, the sudden lack of demand for paper products, um, which has put a bottleneck on a, a good part of the harvesting that's done in Vermont, of Vermont forests. So, um, they have a significant need like many, many other businesses in the state and they, um, but we were not, there wasn't any program set up that really dealt specifically with them or really provided the kind of um, economic relief that they, that their particular industry needs. Um, and so I have been working um, with um, Mike Snyder and, and Sam Lincoln from the Department of Forests and Parks um, and um, Meta has been um, helping right along with sort of the, our committee's work on, on making something come together. And then Mike O'Grady has been drafting it and, and we're about to see what, it, see what it does. But the real reason for it was that this is a significant part of, um, as I said, largely the rural economy that um, is in a bad way um, for the same reasons a lot of other businesses are. And, and there was a need to address their particular issues being in a very uh, high overhead, low margin kind of business. Kitty, you're muted. Thank you. The lawn, my lawn just is getting mowed and so there's noise everywhere and I'm trying to um, not uh, have all of you listen to the lawn more. Uh, Mike, would you walk through this language uh, with us? Sure. So 
the program will be called the Forest Economic Economy Stabilization Grant Program. Five million would be appropriated from the Coronavirus Relief Fund to A and R in fiscal year 21 to establish the program. A and R would then be directed to enter an MOU with VITA for implementation and administration of the program. A and R consulted with VITA. They are willing to do it, um, but they want the money to pass through A and R. Then you see subsection B, which is the kind of the template determination of why the expenditure from this coronavirus relief fund is necessary. It uh, touches on several of the points that Representative Conquest just discussed regarding the pressures on the forest products economy and supply chain. Um, and as a result of the market and supply chain disruptions caused by COVID-19 forest product businesses are suffering significant business interruption that restricts its ability to operate effectively. Um, so then you get a definition of what is economic harm, uh, the expenses or lost revenues or both, and then what is a forest product business. This is actually a definition drawn from statute with um, one slight change. This is uh, from uh, VITA's uh, ag, ag credit program. It's their Vermont enterprises that are primarily engaged in managing, harvesting, trucking, processing, manufacturing, crafting, or distributing forest or wood products derived from Vermont forest. What is different from the VITA definition is that it would also include consulting forestry services and secondary manufacturers of wood products. Um, then you get to what the terms of the memorandum need to address. Um, and uh, it will establish uh, who is going to be, um, what the eligibility criteria will be. Um, they have to have been operating in the state on or before February 1, 2020. And they have to accurately demonstrate to be that the economic harm occurred or accrued between March 1, 2020 before December 1, 2020. Um, there is a reference to the fact that VITA shall establish guidelines identifying the specific types of cost for which recipients um, may use the funds. Uh, and there is a provision about no double dipping. Economic harm is not compensable. The same economic harm has been or will be covered by insurance or by another state or federal grant or other compensation. So I wanna to touch on this for a little bit. This has been a discussion uh, among some of the legislative council attorneys this morning about whether or not there will be, if you get assistance from one program, can you get assistance from another program? So if a forest products business gets assistance under this program, will they be prohibited from seeking assistance under the larger ACCD um, grant programs for businesses such as those with 75% revenue reduction. Uh, I don't know if there's been a decision on that. Uh, that's a big policy call. I don't have anything to say about it except raising it for you. Um, uh, and then VITA creates an application forms. Applicants certify the information is truthful. VITA shall, based on the amount of economic harm, provide the maximum award. Um, the maximum award is going to be $100,000 for each eligible forest business. Um, grants are dispersed as a single payment. VITA asks that grants only be dispersed as a single payment. Um, and then you get uh, the kind of basic terms and conditions. It's a first come, first serve program, $5 million may not be enough to cover all of the economic harm to the industry. Um, federal tax identification numbers and sales amounts are uh, confidential. Data submitted about uh, um, the forest product business is gonna be a trade secret. And then there's a reporting requirement on or before July 1, the agency provides information to you regarding the um, funds to date, uh, including the types of enterprises awarded aggregate amounts of, of 
award by enterprise on aggregate amounts by geographic region. And then they shall provide an update of that on September 1 and then January 1. Okay, I have a question from uh, Dave. Dave? Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mike. Um, when you were talking about the issue of whether these funds could be used, if you got any other funds, I think, um, I, I thought when we were last talking on the Commerce Bill, we were told that you couldn't. Um, but you said, and I may have misunderstood you, you said that's a policy issue for you to consider. I didn't think it was an option. Is it? Uh, do, do we have the discretion to say, even if you did get help through PPE or something else, you can still get help through this CRF? I'm, I'm talking about the monies from the state CRF. I'm not talking yeah. about mixing it up with the PPE or, or other I, stimulus. I'm sorry, I thought, this, I thought this is CRF. So this is the state CRF, right? The coronavirus uh, okay. relief fund. Different pot. A right. different pot of CRF. Got right. it. So, so, and then my next question. Mm -hmm. go, go ahead, Mike. Yeah. So, for example, the conversation been in the ag committees is that some of these large farms are going to have economic harm that far exceeds a hundred thousand dollars. So if they apply for the $100,000 assistance under the Dairy Assistance Program, will they be able to seek reimbursement of their costs or expenses under any of the other grant programs, say the 75% reduction in business grant program that okay. ACCD will? Some people are saying, no, they are prohibited. If they get that $100,000, they can't go to ACCD and seek additional assistance and that that to me is is i i don't i thought the ag committees were understood that that a business could seek whatever relief it felt that it was eligible for but i'm being told that once you apply to one program you can't apply apply to another program when will because we have a ruling um, when will we know Excuse when me? will when will we have um, a consensus? When will there be a determination of, I know it's risky, but. Uh, I think that's up to you all. And I mean, that's you all us. as the body to determine that. Um, I think that's a big policy decision. I understand the argument why, because there's so much demand on these funds that you don't want to allow one business or one sector to try to monopolize them. Um, you want to make them available to as many businesses or business sectors as possible. Uh, but it's not a legal question. It's not, it's not a it's legal not a, question. Not a legal question. Okay. So we Thank decide, you. Kitty, or the policy. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Dave, did you have another question? I interrupted. Um, yeah, well, I, I, you answered it. I think, Mike, I was worried where these dollars were coming from. At first, I thought they were coming out of the ag allocation and that concerned me. Sounds like they're not. No, this is of... 5 million on top of the 30 million for ag. How much is available in the state funding bucket? Well, that's the 400 million, correct? Well, it's being spent many times, right? So, uh, I mean, so it one... be... No, it's... Uh, if the state bucket is the 1.25, what's the right? But right. then there's there's only 400 million that's available right now, correct? I don't know. No the total. Uh, we need to get. We have a total sheet that Maria has in the from JFO where the total. Is. But um, I'm not sure. I we do not have 400 million left. We've spent more than that. We, we have on the order of 250 million left that we're holding, not counting the JFC money. That's what I thought. Right. Hmm. Um, I'm gonna ask the chart. Um, Diane, you have a question. Mary, did you have a question? I, your hand was up and then down. It was up and then down. Um, I had the same question. And so it's been clarified that 
a policy decision needs to be made around whether or not participants in one of the grant programs may also participate in another. Um, the question is then who makes that decision, who makes that policy call? I'd like to put in a um, marker for our committee doing that since we're the only one who sees everything as a group rather than the individual needs and in the individual committees but just for later conversation. Yeah, not much later though, because we're running out of time. So you're right. Um, um, Diane. Sure, so I was wondering too on that same, that same order is an entity won't know if they're been granted something. Right. They're gonna apply. I'm gonna, if I'm running something, I'm gonna apply for everything there's possibly out there because you put a lot of fishing lines in the water when you don't know what you're gonna come through. You could apply for five different places and get nothing, or you could apply for four and get them all, but you're gonna, so I think that would make it difficult for, for people to be able to apply or an entity or a business or, I don't, I don't know how that would work. Yeah, I, I'm, th I'm just thinking like if somebody were to apply for a working lands grant and they wanted 50, you know, 50,000 and they got 10,000, you know, and then how is, if they're going to apply for some sort of dairy sector, who's back of all this, Mike? How do, how do we do this? Uh, that's a great question. I don't know how we Lab would know if the farmer received a grant from another program, the farmer's gonna have to, they're going to have to ask, and then the farmer is going to have to be accurate. Um, oh, wow, this is cumbersome. Marty. Oh, Diane, were you finished? I didn't finish with you. It was, you? I was just saying, because it's cumbersome, because when I'm, you know, we're thinking ag here, but it's, it's, it's a business entity, you know? So, I mean, ag could apply here. It could apply for the mm -hmm. availability in S350, and if that's not there, there's the next commerce bill. I would be applying for all of the above just because you never know what's coming through. Okay. Thank you, Diane. Uh, Marty and then Chip. Well, it's a question of how many separate programs we have set up for particular sectors, such as if we have a dairy program and a forestry program, and then, and then all, all other businesses, as Mike has been trying to keep the commerce stuff being, you know, non-specific. Um, it would, my, my gut feel is if that you're in a specific industry and you can apply for that particular one, you apply for that one and that one only, and we leave the other big pot for everybody else. But we have the other question, I have the other question of some of the money going out is not necessarily grants to, well, such as paying for utility arrearages. Would someone go to DPS and ask for the utility bills to be covered? And then also go to commerce and ask for additional assistance on the business. That might be another double dip. Yeah. Um, I don't think there's a question in there, Marty, other than the question of we have a dilemma. No. Right. 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 Chip and then Dave. Uh, mine's not a, a question either, just a response to the, um, you know, the issue that we're discussing here. But the language that's in the bill says that you can't, you can't receive money funds for things that, um, I wish I had the language in front of me, but basically you, you can't receive more money for things that you've already gotten um, funds to cover. And I think that kind of is part of the um, part of the CRF uh, regulations and, and certainly should be part of what we say within the state that if you have applied for a grant for, um, you know, to cover the, the losses for in a particular area, once you've been granted that, you can't apply somewhere else to cover the same losses. Right, but here's, right. Here, 
here's an example. So in the in the WeLab appropriation and in, in one of the I'm not sure if it's in eco economic development or if it's in commerce, there's a provision that says the the board, the Working Lands Enterprise Board, shall not award grants to businesses in the dairy sector that are eligible for other assistance from the coronavirus relief fund. Not that they receive assistance, that they are just eligible for assistance. So it's not about what costs or expenses were already reimbursed. They are just out of the program because they have another path that they are eligible to pursue. Oh, okay, and, and I mean, that seems to me a a little bit different than what we were just discussing, and that's a particular provision in that particular um, bill or that proposal. Right, um, and maybe you just want to do it on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, and th that's that's a policy call as well. Yeah, I, I agree, and I and I think I, and I think Marty brought that up, and I, and I, I'm starting to think that way too. That we might want to say particularly for those areas where we have created a, a program for a specific sector like dairy or even like the forest economy that in those we've created a program just for that you should not be and I, i'm i'm not saying we should do this i'm just th thinking out loud but we might want to say for those particular areas where we created specific programs we do not expect to have um, you apply to use CRF funds from another program. Outside of that, where there is no specific program, we may want to let people um, apply to get funding to cover their expenses wherever they can get it, just acknowledging that they can't have the same expenses covered more than once. So if they get two different grants, it has to be to cover different, different expenses, right? And we have that double dipping clause in all of them. So we have covered that piece. What we need to decide is with the dairy and forestry, that's a real carve out unlike other, other sectors that if they're applying for this, should they be able to apply for the grants we're going to hear about tomorrow and that we passed uh, last week? Um, Dave? I'm gonna say yes. <laughs> uh, yes. Um, uh, in the Commerce Bill, we did, I think, last week. I was looking for Linda. I don't think she's here today, uh, but maybe the rest you remember. There was a fair amount of money set aside for the uh, regional economic development corporations. I thought to be um, assisters, to, uh, to be helpers with, with people through the process. My understanding correct? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if, if so, yes. I... Oh, thank you, Marty. Um, if so, um, I, I would hope that they had um, uh, their fingers on the utility assistance that we talked about this morning on the floor uh, and any other uh, lines of assistance, small business administration, et cetera, et cetera, for applicants who come into the door. What, what, I'm, what I'm increasingly worried about, I've always been worried about, is uh, we go back to the old therapeutic dose. I'm a business. I need $150,000 to keep on going, but I can only get 100,000 here. And if I can't get the balance anywhere else, who have we helped? Maybe you could argue, well, you've helped the vendors that Dave owed, that you know he was in, uh, in arrears to, um, but you haven't kept his business going. Are, are, we, are we about trying to you know, spread the manure so thin uh, that, that it doesn't do any good? And, and um, let me just continue that a little bit more. I, I don't know, this is a $5 million uh, figure I think we're talking about. I don't know, does the forestry industry need 200 million? I mean, and yet uh, why five? Because that's all there is. It's around, you know, I'm not trying to be critical. And, and by, uh, I don't wanna waste 5 million and maybe it should be thrown into some other pot to make a therapeutic dose for somebody in some other sector. So I, I guess I have two questions. One that Marty answered, the regional economic development folks play an important role. I've sent constituents to them. And the second one is, how big is the forestry need? And is 5 million just, uh, you know, is, is it just uh, 
not real, not not wholly helpful at all. Do you have a sense of that, Chip? Um, yes, and Mike might might remember numbers better than I do. Um, so, in talking to people in forests and parks um, who um, who have a real, I think, pretty good sense of this, the need is bigger um, than than the five million dollars. But I but I think that they I know that they believe that this will be a real a significant help to some people who really need it. That that this will make a difference for a number of people in the in that in the forest economy. Um, and you know, I I I guess I didn't hear them say I don't want to put words in their mouth. Um, but but my sense is that they were suggesting that that this could make the difference between whether some people are able to stay in business or not. So I, I think, and I'll, I'll be happy to go um, email Mike Snyder and Sam Lincoln and, and ask them, um, but I, I think they would say this is a therapeutic dose. Thank you. Thank you, Chip. Diane? I just got a thought. So earlier in a couple of bills ago, we put specific language in that said, nursing homes will have at least 5 million, but that at least, that, but it did not stop them from being able to access more. And I think that's what we're doing with this. We're saying, listen, forestry, you're, you're gonna need a little something and probably a lot more, but we're gonna make sure that you have just for you this amount and that you are still open to being able to apply to any other thing that we've also have. But we're gonna make sure that your industry does not have to compete with, with X, Y, Z and, and W for this, but we're gonna, we're just gonna make a little, a little bit for you here. And then you can add to it as you wanna apply or not apply to other things. That's well, how that, I see that, the same. That depends on the language in the other programs. Because this right. this this does this doesn't have that limit, but some of the other programs may have that limit, and so. Yes, but we didn't do it when we talked about adult days, nursing sure. homes. Or we said, listen, we're gonna we're gonna give you this, and then but you have at least this, but you can still apply for more. But so, I know it's gonna be on a case by case, but we we have a we have a way that we've already been consistent with at least that part. I'm gonna make myself believe that, Mike. I'm shaking my head, yes. So my question is if, if you if you want to apply for more than one just because you don't know what you're going to get and you actually receive duplicate dollars, it's up to the person who received those duplicate dollars then to get the money back to the state. And, and who is checking up on all of these grants to make sure they didn't apply for more than one and the duplication happens? So I, I think know, that, uh, is that to me? Well, uh, no, I'm just putting it out there. I know duplication is not supposed to happen, but how do we check up on it? With their receipts, they're gonna have to show what they, you can't buy the same PPE two times over or the same expense. No, they're, gonna, no. they're not gonna use it all. But, it, but if, I, if I am paying off some of my vendors, how um, is ag going to know if I got it from ag or if I got it from uh, commerce? So I just, got, I just got an email from commerce, from David Hall in commerce. And he says they're having the exact same conversation right now. And that Chair Cott recommends that appropriation needs to make a decision on whether a single bit <laughs> access Sierra funds through more than one source. Hey, thanks, Mike. <laughs> okay. That's interesting. We, Marty and then Mary. We can oh, apply Diane, for more, I would say apply for more than one, but you cannot double dip on the same expense. No. Um, uh, Peter has his thumbs up. Mary is a no. 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 Marty, do you want your hand is up, Marty? Marty, are you going to? No, I, I don't agree with Diane either on that one, I don't think. No. 
Um, Mar Mary, I, I just called on you, Marty, because your hand was up, but I put it down I, for you. I was going to say something else, but no. Oh, okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I was just going to, I was going to disagree with Diane's first thought that the, the nurse, the carve out we made for nursing homes, I thought was within the health stabilization fund, meaning that within that fund, we were going to use at least 5 million for nursing homes. And yes, maybe a nursing home might, or they, that industry might get more than five, but that was within the 250 pot. Not in my mind, it wasn't then, okay, now you can go over to the commerce's program and ask for money. Um, there's some confusion here. Uh, Mary. Um, so I have oodles of thoughts here. Just, just for a second, let's, let's stay on the question of applying for different sources of money. So I'm a dairy. I, I got to interrupt you. I realize, Mike, we're holding you. Are, do you need to be somewhere? Because this is way beyond your scope or, you know, be to, beyond your ag. This is broad language. Are you good helping us get through this or do you need to be gone? I, I am. My, my afternoon uh, canceled. So I, I am available. Well, excellent. And Mary, I apologize. Yeah, for that's okay. Poor Mike. So, so he has to stay and listen to this, us, us to mulling this. Yeah. All this problem. Yeah, I hope he can. So think about a dairy producer who has a few other lines of business. So they're going to be eligible for dairy. Theoretically, they could be also eligible for the forest products thing because they, you know, they've got a stand of, of, of trees. Um, they can apply for um, the um, assistance with um, arrearages on their utilities. There's nothing to, to help to prevent that. They could, you know, they're renting some property, you know, uh, they to maybe to the folks who work on their land, but they're renting. So they're going to be able to apply for some rental assistance. They're going to be able to apply for money across the board. And I come to Dave's question, he always frames it so nicely and succinctly, this question of a therapeutic dose. Um, there, we are cre creating doses so much larger for some groups of people than we are for others. Um, Diane referenced what we did with the healthcare slash human services bill. Frankly, I was uncomfortable with the specific allocation of dollar amounts on the human services side. I really liked what healthcare did, that really thoughtful analysis of, it talked about sustainability, uh, a regional spread, looking at what, what was necessary system-wide, not just to the single employer, to sustain a valuable resource to the community. I tried, and I'm, I'm a day late and a dime short on this conversation. I tried to think about how we could pick up that language and drop it into the ag bill. Because to me, that's the question that we have with agriculture. It's incredibly important to support it, but just spreading the peanut butter across every producer of a certain amount rather than looking at what the system needs in order to survive these times is, is wrong. And I'm just really disappointed that we didn't get a proposal like that, that so carefully, thoughtfully laid out, you know, how to think about the sustainability of agriculture, not just how to put money into people's pockets. And I, I you know, at the end of the day, I'm, I'm going to try, I'm, I'm trying to support this, but I'm just really disappointed that we didn't have that same sort of careful, thoughtful analysis. And I yammered at Chip for an hour trying to find a way we could do it. And it's just too late now. We don't have any time. But I think we have to pay careful attention to this. Thanks.
Diane. So I just want to, so I'm, what I'm, what I would probably not be comfortable with is somebody like saying, to playing within the same sector, so to speak. But I, what I am comfortable with is saying, well, you can apply for, let's say an ag relief and a utility relief and, uh, you know, but maybe not forestry and dairy. But I am with Dave on the therapeutic dose. It depends. Um, and it's also going to come down to just like anything else. If you are a good grant writer, if you are a good communicator, this will work for you. And I don't know if we can fix that. Thank you, Diane. Um, Dave. Me. Are we, uh, does this language, I could look, I just uh, scroll through here. Um, does the ag money go to the Secretary of Agriculture? Does it go to the Agency of Ag? Yes. The same way yes. the health money went to AHS? Mm -hmm. It does. So we could, could we not take the same distribution money language, excuse me, that we use for AHS and put it onto the Secretary of Ag and say this, you'll distribute the money in the following. Begins to have some of that uh, broader policy depth as opposed to who's first in the door. Is it applicable? I, I, I looked at that, Dave, and realized how specific it was to um, the healthcare system. Mike is brilliant, and maybe <laughs> he could, you know, take that as a template. Yeah, right. yeah and figure out if there's a way to translate it into agriculture. I mean, we could, uh, maybe the Committee on Ag in the Senate and the House had this conversation, and I don't know if we have to get this out today or tomorrow, but could, could we flip it to the uh, Secretary and say, here's our concern, do you have a, have a response? And does this language work for you? And Mike may be able to make the language more transferable and appropriate. I mean, if it's if in another twelve hours, we if we have that, uh, Madam Chair, you know, we could the secretary might might um, welcome the opportunity to try to look at this in a more um, strategic sort of way. Um, it's it's critical that we put this money out in a thoughtful manner and and that it's done correctly. We also are on a huge time crunch, or we're going to be in here into past next week into the following week, which. Uh, could put us closer to the July 1st, but as long as the quarter uh, the quarter budget is out, then we're all welcome to be here in July. What I would like now is I would like Chip to leave this meeting because I think that there may be some negotiations going on between the House and Senate Ag Committees, and I need you to bring this um, this dilemma to the two of the you know to that group to be addressed because if they come to an agreement. And then we say, you know, well, we had this dilemma, but we didn't let you know about it. So, Chip, I think you need to excuse yourself and get that communication. <laughs> but before you do, I want to make sure we're sending the right communication, what exactly the dilemma is. And is it something we need to fix in other bills or is it just within this ag issue? Because it's, 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 specifically to ag and forestry, where the other ones are more broad, except Mary, you're right, you can get a, a grant from economic development, and then you can get rental assistance, and then you can go and, and um, you know, with your utility bill and get help there. Um, so Mike, what is the message that Chip, you've been, <laughs> what is the message? <laughs> you can't ask Mike that. Oh, okay. why not? I mean, what, what is um, the, the dilemma that we're seeing? I know that you can't weigh in on this, but I was hoping you could frame it for us. Um, how, so how I, I was trying to find the AH, AHS language you're referencing. What, what language is that? Uh, I'm, section, I'm, section six, I believe, has the uh, uh, guidance uh, for AHS on the distribution. I'll pull it up quick. Hold on here. Too many bills kicking around. There it is. Talking about the minimums. 
No, it's in the line in the bill. <laughs> Describes how they'll distribute it based on a number of factors, geographic distribution, oh, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. Mary rattled them off this morning to me. Um, she might be yeah, yeah, yeah. now. It's on page eleven, Michael, of of H uh, nine sixty five. Thank you. Chip, can you send at least a text to see where they are in those negotiations so that we don't uh, miss an opportunity, please, or an email, or mute yourself and make a phone call to Carolyn, perhaps? Um, I think I have Carolyn's phone number. I don't have her in my cell phone. Um, yeah, I can. Um, but, but you were going to say, what's the message that um, I'm carrying to the to them? To them? Well, we do. I, we have a dilemma right now about how many programs that you can apply for, and what is the record record keeping, and making sure that we do have a double dipping clause. But well, Kitty, I'm not that sure that's a question for them. I think it's a question for us about whether or not we want how we want folks to participate. I mean, we can ask their opinion. Well, if we're going to add it to the Ag Bill, and the Ag Bill is a compromise, we have to make sure that the other side is on board, that they are aware of the conversation. If we're just going to put it in the Economic Development Bill to relate to all bills, then we can do that separately. But if we're going to make a change to the Ag Bill, we have to let both sides know that about that change now to negotiate it in. So I'm going to... I'm assuming that you're talking specifically here about dairy because remember the ag bill um, contains um, some funding for diversified or non-dairy agriculture as well um, and and processors and I don't know if you want to separate them out but the question is do you are you talking about just having this apply if we were to do something like this just apply to the dairy farm support or do you mean for it to apply to the whole ag bill which would which would cover diversified ag folks and processors and and of course forestry um, and we have three minutes to um, to figure something out because we need to move from this and move to uh, Sarah Clark is joining us we have a, an amendment that we need to get done. Um, what I need to do, this is something that is going to, we're going to get bogged down with the whole committee. And a part of it has to do with CHIP. And I would like to have a, a couple of members. Uh, I don't, we don't have a virtual room, a breakout room. I don't know how to do a breakout room. But if, if CHIP and maybe um, Mike, you said you had some time this afternoon to consider some language. Is there anybody else who would like to join this bit? that would be willing to get caught up on the DCF housing piece at a later date to make sure that we have some fairness and consistency or to bring back to us to then work on, not to make a decision, but to move the conversation so we're not just stuck. Why are you laughing, Dave? Well, I'm just chuckling. I, I enjoy it, that's all. <laughs> oh, I don't see Carrie. I yes. wonder if having Mike, it looks like, has looked at or is looking at the healthcare language, mm -hmm. and if we could send him off to see if there's a way to create similar sort of language for us. You mean for the dairy? Are you talking about the dairy bill, Mary, or to yes. be? Like, well, if it's if it's my, more the dairy bill, we that that conversation has to get to the two chairs of agriculture now. That there's right. a pickup. I it, yes, I understand that, and it is particular to the dairy bill, but I think it also needs to be considered across the board. I mean, this is an issue that we're uncovering with everything. But the urgent issue is ag. And so I guess there needs to be a conversation there. Maybe Chip can tell the chairs of the committees that we're concerned and we can ask Mike if he can 
see a way to get some sort of language similar to what we were trying to do on the health care bill that could then be worked with those two committees. So is the language in the health care bill, the one that says the Department of Health shall use the funds and shall basically appropriate them based on factors such as race or ethnicity, immigrant status, sexual orientation? No. No? What, what? I'm, I'm not finding what you're referencing. Okay. It's, um, it's, it's section six, page 11. I'm looking at the bills introduced. Yeah, so go to page 11, top of page 11, you'll see by provider type, aggregate amounts awarded by yeah. geographic region of the state. Yeah. Okay. Um, right before section seven, top of the page. So while Mike's reading that, I, I, I want to jump in here. I, I'm confident that Mike could draft something that could be applicable that we could if the committee decides this is the way to do it, we could run by the Secretary of Ag to see if they're capable, willing, whatever. Um, but there's two issues here. One is, do we want to ask the agency to make those kinds of considerations before awarding grants? And the other one is, are we going to allow people across the board or within certain grant programs to apply for CRF dollars outside of that specific program. There's two two different questions there. That's that's one thing that our committee needs to to uh, vote on, which is, you know, if you're applying for a grant within one program, should it exclude you from applying for a grant in any other program within this one point two dollars? So if if you get a, you know, you need a hundred thousand dollars and you get a ten thousand dollar working lands grant. Should you be able to apply for other ones for additional help? Or you could use the other argument, you got a hundred thousand dollar a working grant, um, and you need, you know, hundred thousand dollars, but you don't know if you're gonna get it, should you be able to apply for another program? So you can look at it on the, you know, on the depending if you wanna be the devil asking the question. So how just think for a minute do we want a broad statement saying if you apply within this program you can't apply anywhere else is that a fair question to ask the committee to take a position on i didn't ask the question yet i'm just asking that question if you apply for a program you shouldn't be able to apply can you define anywhere else because that's where i have a struggle yeah, within the 1.25 is, I think, where our focus is right now is within the 1.25. But Kitty, to me, the, the question is a little more specific, or maybe it is just in the dairy, not just, but uh, the dairy is a good example. So if I'm a dairy farmer and I have lost, um, you know, $60,000 per milk check, and, and there's no way that even the dairy program is going to provide enough grant funding to make that up? Should I be allowed to apply somewhere else in one of the um, Commerce Committee bills for the same kind of, not, not to replace the same loss because I haven't made it all up, but the same kind of loss. So my, the loss of revenue from my milk check. That, that's a, to me an important question. And I, my own personal answer to that is no, I should not be allowed to apply for that same milk check loss in those two different places. But if I also have other needs that are unrelated to my dairy, like as somebody pointed out, I'm, I'm renting something or, um, you know, I have mm -hmm. those other needs, then I think personally, I think you should be allowed to apply to a different grant program for that. Um, I agree with and you. And I agree, this is Marty. <laughs> So this, I disagree. And so this is where we're going to stop the conversation. I have three DCF members that are here. And so I need a small group of people that would like to go into a breakout room and you can figure it may be on your phones or however you can um, to break this up. But we have to transition to the DCF housing piece at this time. Um, 
Chip, you need to get this message to um, the two chairs of agriculture so that they know that we're, we're looking at perhaps putting a provision um, in their bill. Is there anyone who wants to work with Chip and Chip will stay in touch with Mike O'Grady and uh, catch up later on the DC F piece? I will. Okay, Marty, anyone else? I, as I will, Marty. Oh, I have Marty. Sure. And I'll, I'll do what I can. Okay, the three. Well, I, I, I know you're trying to move us along, I've, I, I, but I get, I get to weigh in, but I have to stay here for this. <laughs> Wait, do you have to stay? I really have the DCF housing. No, I, I don't, but I care deeply about this, and I've already told Chip everything that I feel about this, and we have not been able to agree on it. So then stay here. Yeah. So, yeah. Kitty. Yes. But, I actually have my hand up and have had it up for a couple oh, of minutes. Peter, I'm sorry. Peter. That's yes. okay. I just wanted to make a point. We're talking about cross coordinating who uh, uh, grants here to ensure that, you know, we're talking about someone only receives one grant from the 1.25 billion. We would have to create a, at some level a master, um, a deconflictor. And I, I don't want to do that. No. You know, to be able to figure it out. I don't know if the computer systems in the state of Vermont could actually talk to each other to figure out if somebody's <laughs> already applied for a grant. Right. So we no, need to remember we're not doing that. It. We need to yeah. remember that. That's it. Okay, so we're, we're not making any decisions. I just need a group to go off and work on this and, and make sure that you know all, all points of views are being considered. And then we'll bring this discussion back. Um, and, and I'm sorry for this, but we are down to um, yeah. really yeah. 11th hour and we have a huge agenda because we have a municipal bill that we have to do on top of the, the um, amendment we're going to do on top of dairy, on top of economic development and a couple of amendments all before 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. <laughs> okay. uh, those of you that would like to leave as long as I have six or more for the housing piece and you remember you're not making a decision but we need to inform that group that's working. Um, Ooh, I'm going off with Chip. I'm going to- um, Where are we going? Allow, uh, not allow, I'm going to tell Carolyn um, to inform their, the both committees that this is what we're considering. That after that, I'm not sure how to have a, a group meeting. I, I think cannot I do it on my phone. I'm happy to have a conference call on my house phone or something. But okay, and then I've, I've just um, I just wanted to inform the speaker of this larger uh, issue. And Mary, could you send Mitzi a, a, a more complete text of what I okay. was talking about, just so that yeah. she's aware of the issue? And she may, she's yeah. great, maybe she'll have a, a path forward very quickly. But now, since you've been waiting very patiently and we're seven minutes late, I apologize, Sarah. Uh, I see uh, you, I see Sean Brown, and I've seen Ken. And Ken, I don't know if you've been in our committee since your announcement to leave. But on behalf of our committee, I want to thank you for your service to the state and what you've done for uh, children and families uh, in this state. It's, it's been um, incredible work, um, I'm sure very satisfying work, but difficult at the same time. And you're going to be a real loss to the department. And I want to thank you for your longstanding time and effort. Thank you very much, Representative Toll. It really, um, it really has been an honor to serve. I've greatly appreciated working with your committee over the last couple of years. Um, I do feel very proud of the work that we've all done together. So thank you very much. Thank you. Um, and, and best wishes. Um, and, and good luck with that dog you're picking up in Danville. If it comes from Danville and from the kingdom, it's going to be a quality, I'm sure. <laughs> Uh, and so, Kimberly, you have an amendment that we're working on, and Sarah, uh, I'm not sure what the, uh, Dave, your hand is up. Do you, can I put it, you're good, okay. Um, Kimberly, uh, I didn't, I don't know the format, if you want to give the overview, or if Sarah wants to jump in uh, with the money right away, um, can you just give us a, or you guys have the floor, who's going to give the overview, and then we'll hear about the money, please. Um, how about if I just jump in for one minute? 
So uh, I just came from a meeting of uh, human services where all 11 members as individuals have signed on to the language that Teresa is going to pull up. And that will be the services component that fits with what Rep. Stevens covered today in terms of the units being built as part of 966. And uh, the DCF folks are here today to go over some of the numbers that lie behind this language. Thank you. Uh, Teresa, you're gonna get the... I, I apologize, I'm a bit distracted. I'm trying to text about this other issue at the same time that I am doing this. So I apologize. Oh, good, Linda's here. Um, I don't have the language in front of me. Does everybody else have it on the screen? Oh, so Representative Cole, may I start? Uh, yes, you may. I'm sorry. I had people's, uh, I had all the, the, what if, the Hollywood squares in front of me. And not, so thank you. Thank you again. If you'd like to walk through the language, that would be uh, great. Yeah. I will just very briefly just um, introduce myself, Ken Schatz. Uh, Commissioner of the Department for Children and Families. Um, I do want you to know that we uh, do support the proposed um, language that is being put forth as an amendment to H-966. As um, Representative Jessup just pointed out, we did just participate in a joint meeting of House General and House Human Services, where we did talk about this um, legislation. So I want you to know that we support it. And then we'll turn to uh, Sean, who can provide, can walk through it and summarize um, what's in the bill. And appreciate Sarah Clark, the Chief Financial Officer for the uh, Secretary's Office of the Agency of Human Services, being here today to also speak specifically as needed to the um, financial aspects of this. So I can turn it, I'll turn it over to Sean. Thank you. Uh, Sean? Thank you. Um, I too will miss Ken. I've had the privilege of serving under two great commissioners, uh, Commissioner Schatz and former Commissioner Dave Iacovone. Um, Ken will be missed. Um, and so I, I appreciate um, all the support he's given me over the years. Um, so we've been working closely um, with the House Human Services Committee and the General Housing and Military Affairs Committee to move forward um, uh, this bill that we're considering today which is based on our AHS housing recovery plan, which we developed in response to um, the large number of households that we are serving in motels under the emergency housing program in response to COVID. Um, as the language in the bill indicates, we might serve upwards of 300 families um, in the middle of the winter when the program um, has adverse weather conditions. Um, given uh, you know, the impact of COVID, we now have approximately 1,400 households in motels right now. And we um, truly believe that um, this is an opportunity and we don't want to return to the status quo into the system that existed um, prior to COVID where motels and, and shelter systems were made up the bulk of the service delivery, delivery for homeless uh, households in Vermont. Um, this uh, proposal um, and this bill um, complement and supplement the, the work of the other housing proposals by the uh, VHCB and uh, the Agency of Commerce and Community Development. Um, the, the VHCB is trying to bring on new units um, and, um, which are desperately needed in the state for homeless families. Um, the ACCD proposal really looks at um, trying to um, prevent further homelessness in the state with their rental arrearage program and mortgage assistance program, and also support um, private landlords and other landlords in, in rehabbing some existing stock to bring them up to code and hopefully bring them to market, which are desperately needed as well. And then our plan, um, which complements and supplements that, brings some proposes to bring some subsidies um, some intense service delivery, some rapid resolution funds with the goal of moving um, all of these households that we have in motels right now in response to COVID to more permanent housing solutions. Um, we aim to do that through um, one of our first goal is to end family homelessness. There are approximately 250 households with children in motels and in the shelter system. 
Um, our plan proposes providing a um, Vermont, Vermont rental subsidy like subsidy to all of those households and move them into permanent housing with a goal to then bridge them to a federally funded voucher during that time frame. Um, also, um, providing some rapid resolution funds for other households that might include um, uh, rental assistance, um, paying off uh, back rent to allow them to come into good standing so that they could uh, lease a new apartment um, for a variety of reasons and, um, and then provide a surge of funding to our partners um, to do this work. Services are critical uh, to moving families and maintaining families into permanent housing. Um, it's complex works and the needs of the families we're serving are highly complex and they and they a uh, whole host a range of um, issues that we need to tackle with those households. Um, and also with the hope to um, bring um, some private landlords back in, into the work we do and to work with us to serve some higher risk families who have uh, suffered some loss in the past re renting to high risk families. Um, we're proposing um, creating a, a risk pool so if they suffer a loss that we can make them whole uh, if they come to work with us and, and provide some units that we can move households into. Um, we're proposing to do that using just over $16 million of COVID relief funds through the first um, six months or so of the year into late December. And then our plan would leverage approximately another 7 million of existing funding to continue those supports and services um, through the next six months. And so this language here today before the Appropriations Committee uh, focuses solely on the work and the dollars of the COVID relief fund, the over 16 million. And so when, you, when we talk about that, just keep that framework in your mind that there are other funds within our existing appropriations that we'll be leveraging post-December to continue this work. Um, and so our original proposal um, uh, kind of bucketed the money into these, these categories that I just described of the different components of our plan um, in working with the committees of jurisdiction, the policy committees. Um, it was their intent and desire to, um, instead of breaking it out by appropriation, to appropriate as a sum, which would then allow us the flexibility if needed to, to, to if, if the, grade, the need was greater in one area that we would have some flexibility. We think that's a good idea and we support that, that approach here in this bill. Hi, let me make sure. And so I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions on our proposal. Um, and I'm more than happy to break down the original dollars in the plan and how we were contemplating using them if, that, if the committee wants us to kind of review that with them. Please. So, uh, Teresa, can you move down the amendment? We were stuck on the purpose, and and so this is for the sixteen million. So the sixteen million is now reflected in the sixty-eight million in the purpose section above. Is that correct? That no. Um, yes. So it's sixteen additional million that is, and it's it's reflected in in that number above. Okay. Okay, so for the committee, um, and Teresa, can you um, can I see the rest of this amendment because I haven't had a chance to see it. I'm sorry. Um, and Sean, I have to really apologize. I've been texting and I can't and I haven't been paying enough attention to both of these. And I, I was I really am trying to sort out this other problem. And so the 16 million for this rental assistance program. Is it all CRF dollars or are we drawing down FEMA dollars as well? And did you go over this and I just need to get caught up on my- No, I didn't touch on that specifically. So uh, thank you. Um, right now, our proposal does include approximately um, 5.8, just under $5.8 million um, to continue supporting housing families and households and motels while we implement this plan. Those are in this bill as COVID relief dollars. We are certainly pursuing um, FEMA reimbursement for some of those costs. Um, you know, we do have an approved plan from FEMA to use non-congregate um, motel settings um, um, for, FEMA, for FEMA resources. Um, we have just submitted our first claim 
for some of the motel spending we've done um, when we opened the program up completely in March and April. And Sarah Clark can um, um, brief the committee on that a little bit if you want to talk more about that. But we are contemplating um, pursuing FEMA money where appropriate uh, to support this plan. But we don't, at this point, this plan is based on what we know now. And obviously, if we're able to leverage FEMA dollars, we would do so, but we would still use the CRF for the 25% match for that for the FEMA funding. And is that included within the 16 million? That would be a part of uh, the, the motel spending. We would utilize it for that if, if needed. So Sarah, would you like to put up the spreadsheet and walk mm -hmm. through the spreadsheet with us? That, that I think that would be helpful at this time. And then I've got to get... Um, Teresa, do you have that or would you like me to... I do. Yeah, my I, I, Kimberly sent it to me. Um, I'm happy to do whichever is easier. Do you want control Maybe. or do you want me to do it? Um, I can I can take control, though it makes me a little nervous. Um. <laughs> okay, here you go. Let me let me try. And I'm gonna just I'm gonna use the um, the uh, presentation that DCF had provided. Um, just be don't don't screen your share until you've got it up. Okay. You see it? <laughs> and is yeah. it is it is it legible? <laughs> yeah. Yes. yes. This is good. Okay. Thank you, okay. Um, and so I don't know if you want me to kind of at a high level walk you through these buckets. I think Sean is best suited to provide the narrative, um, but I can um, maybe kick us off and then Sean or Ken can can chime in. Do the high level, Sarah, sure. and fill in the, they'll fill in the details. Sure. I, I think it's a, an important point to make that it's um, kind of overall, it's estimated to be a $23 million package. And you can see that number right here across a variety of activities. This uh, plan focuses on doing using the coronavirus relief fund to provide a kind of short term cash investments to help transition um, households out of motels and into more permanent housing, as Sean was saying. And so Toward that end of this 23 million, 16 million roughly is proposed to come out of the coronavirus relief fund across a variety of activities. In addition to the coronavirus relief fund, we're also leveraging some ESG federal dollars. We received, as this committee is aware, additional tranches of funding from the federal government from for ESG, um, and we will be leveraging $1.75 million of those funds as part of this plan. In addition, and the timing is important, we are going to be using some of the existing general fund and DCF's budget for the periods from January through July um, to continue the functions proposed here, as well as we are leveraging some global commitment dollars. Both the general fund and the global commitment are within DCF's existing budget. So it's this plan does not propose to uh, need additional general fund resources to support in state fiscal year 21. So with, with that said, and, and maybe, you know, Sean's kind of spoke to these buckets when he give, gave his overview, but as you look at the activities, so there's the family housing rental assistance for two and a half million dollars over the course of state fiscal year 21. That's a combination of coronavirus relief funds ESG federal dollars, as well as some uh, existing general fund in the base of DCF. So Sarah, in your second column where you have CRF, FEMA, and other federal funds, and it totals to 16 million, those are all CRF and not FEMA and other? Yes, they're all CRF right now. And why don't we kind of drill on, uh, in on that conversation? So what Sean was just discussing is that the item on here that we know for sure is potentially FEMA allowable is the general assistance dollars from July to September of this $5.8 million roughly. You can see yes. my mouse hovering over that. Um, the reason why it's, it's a potential FEMA allowable and we are asking for CRF authority right now is that we, um, we know that FEMA has given us approval to use FEMA funding for congregate or non-congregate housing 
through the emergency declaration period that right now is extended until July 10th. This is a month by month um, kind of, we make a request to FEMA and they, they grant that allowability to use FEMA funds for these purposes. And mm -hmm. so we just received last week that uh, permission through July 10th. I don't know how long that's going to extend into state fiscal year 21. I expect that we will submit another request at the beginning of July, but I should be clear that's kind of outside of my involvement. But to the extent that we do um, submit the request and FEMA extends it, we would anticipate drawing down FEMA dollars for the motel program in state fiscal year 21. And then 25% of that number would remain and then 75% would drop to the bottom line for other needs. That's exactly right. You know, I expect as, as we come back together again in August that we will be having these kind of reconciliation conversations um, with updates based on the information that we've learned um, over July. So in that column, the only one that you think may be FEMA uh, eligible is the general assistance piece or are there others? It's, it's just that piece um, and, we, and- We, we did um, uh, make a request of FEMA to utilize some of their other programs, uh, disaster case management and disaster rental assistance, which we were hoping to use to support this plan longer term, that request was denied. So for the how rental assistance and, and case management, we're, we were not able to leverage and we don't expect to be able to leverage FEMA funding for those components of this plan. Thank you, Sean, for that clarification. Mm -hmm. um, Sarah, were, did you, was there anything else on this chart you wanted to, I think it's pretty explanatory. Can we go right to questions? That works for me. <laughs> okay. It's pretty self-explanatory. It said. is, and it ties to Sean's narrative, so. Yeah, perfectly, thank you. Yeah. Uh, Dave, I'm gonna stop sharing if that's okay. Yes, that's fine. Dave? Uh, I, I think it's a, a really impressive plan. Um, there's a lot of moving parts to it. A couple of questions though to clarify. Uh, my understanding, uh, all of our understanding, I think the CRF money has a deadline to be spent by 1230. But the ESG money, I understand, as an aside, um, Jeff from your staff, uh, uh, Ken and Sean did a great job of walking me through this and I watched one of the U YouTubes. But my understanding is the ESG column does not have a 1230 must spend by limitation. Is that correct? That is correct. It's our understanding that we have a 24 month period to expend those resources. Yep. And that to me uh, is going to be critical because the need for, for many people, for some it's a softer touch than others. And for others, it's much more, it being the case management, is much more intensive. And to have that capacity to keep it going a bit longer is a key or we're going to have many many people in housing uh, uh, from the various housing pieces we have throughout all this different legislation we've worked on without sufficient supports to uh, make it successful. Um, just a, an observe, a comment though the um, five million dollars for navigation slash case management which ends, the bulk of it ends um, 1230, another million continues on for another uh, 24 months, which is great. Um, will that be given to your housing opportunity programs throughout the state? Will they get an allocation and told to manage that? And is it likely that some of those staff might continue on in the ESG funding um, for the remainder of the duration? That's exactly our, our thinking, um, Representative, that um, we would allocate these resources out to our housing partners who we rely on to do that, that work, um, intensive work, and that many, hopefully those resources will be able to continue on January um, with the ESG funding here. And then hopefully, depending on our success, um, we do have our normal housing opportunity program um, and this is a, a, a very ambitious effort to end family homelessness and really make a dent in, in single adult household homelessness. And if we're successful, um, you know, we might be able to reevaluate how we spend some of our existing resources not reflected here in the plan 
that are available through our housing opportunity program to continue to support that work be into January and beyond. Because as you indicated, we know that many of our families, um, getting them housed is just the first step to permanency, that many of them have very high needs and that um, are at risk of losing housing without those supportive services long-term. So hopefully in, in another bill, we have $30 million targeted toward rental arrearages. And hopefully that money will help prevent more people from coming over the transom into the homeless bucket um, and, and allow you to manage just, just the, the 1,400 families. But um, that's for people I think who are already housed that 30 million. It may not help you here, but it could prevent people from yes. coming into uh, home, homelessness here. Now that, that allocation to the housing opportunity programs across the state, is that some type of formula? Do they have to, is there an RFP? Do they have to apply? Or sitting here today, could you say, no, Franklin's gonna get this. And of course, Lamoille, which is a special area is gonna get <laughs> even more. Yeah. We so should write I, that I, in the I, bill, Madam Chair. Yeah. So I mean, you don't have good dogs. <laughs> yeah. So, so we're still, you know, we're in the planning process to to implement this program. I think some of our our funding decisions are going to be based on the numbers of households in, in motels in each district, and look at what is going to be the level of effort needed in those areas to move that those numbers of family to permanency or households to permanency. Yeah. So that sounds to me like it's going to be adjusted depending on where the people are. Yes. Yeah. You wouldn't just divide by 14 counties. And exactly. I, I got you. I, you'll wait yeah. in some factor. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Dave. Uh, Kimberly. Thank you. So on back to that point about the hop network, is that intended to be hop only or including hop? So it could include some partners who are not part of hop. It could include partners that are not a part of HOP. We are always expanding the number of the partners we work with, um, whether it's through the HOP program or the general assistance community investments. Um, like we're, fun, we're, we're starting to work with a couple new community investments in, in our emergency housing through the HOP program. Um, just starting this fiscal year coming up, we're issuing some new grants out through that process. So we are open to working um, with different providers to meet, make sure the need is being met for these families. Great, thank you. And then one more, if I could, Madam Chair, the um, the ESG money. I do understand that it has a twenty four month period, but my recollection is that two point three million came from BAA two. So when does that twenty four month clock start ticking? We will have. I don't know the exact answer on when that clock starts ticking. We'll have to. Um, get back to you with the answer to that question. Thank you, Kimberly. Are there any other questions for either Sean or Sarah or Ken? Um, do we know if the committee down the hall uh, took a vote on this amendment today, Kimberly or Sarah, did you take a vote? Yeah, um, they did not take an official vote because they don't technically, well, they decided all to go on as individuals. So all 11 members of human services are listed across the top of this as sponsors. Right, but the committee itself didn't take a position on the vote. Well, um, no, they didn't actually do a vote, but 11 members signed on yeah, to I, it. Effectively. Right, I, I see that, but there, there is they are individual members there and not acting as the committee. So I... Uh, Would, and they don't have there. possession. And it's their oh. amendment. Well, uh, no, their amendment to us. You're right. It's their. It's amendment. our bill. It's our bill. Yeah, it's I'm our bill. My paperwork, Madam Chair. That's right. <laughs> um, Anne, are you there? I can see you. Yeah. Uh, you have a question? I will come on. Um, <clears throat> um, Madam Chair, I'm not sure your concern. Um, uh, you all have have um, the appropriate. This is an appropriations committee bill, right. and the um, House Human Services loves the bill. We would like to make an addition. So, eleven members of House Human Services, because we don't have possession of the bill, but we we want to just add some things to your bill, which um, uh, the commissioner and deputy commissioner and. Uh, 
chief financial officer um, have just walked through and everyone loves it. Thank you. I, I had for, I just, the clarification in my own mind, I have, I have about 13 things dancing in my head and that we did not need, we did not need, um, it would not come from your committee. It would come directly from the appropriations with just 11 members, not just the important 11 members uh, on the amendment. Thank you, Ann. Um, and so this is just an, this is an amendment for our committee to um, to vote on to be on the House floor tomorrow. Are there any final questions for Sarah or for Sean or Ken on the proposal? It's an exciting proposal. It moves us in a, a, a good direction. There's been a lot of um, angst and heartburn around the the you know just the use of the motel vouchers and not moving in a, a more permanent. Peter? Thank you. Sean, thank you. Um, a lot of works are doing, a lot of groups are doing a lot of hard work on, on, on trying to house and rehouse the homeless right now. Um, can you kind of put into context how this will work instead of the proposal that was made in the, in the actual FY21 budget to hand over the responsibilities for uh, working with homeless over to the community action agencies. So just, just, and I'm asking for a huge compare and contrast here, but you had to have, it had to have crossed your mind, you know, this is how this would compare with that. So this, our housing recovery plan is, if you step back and think about the proposal that was in the original SFY21 budget to go to a community-based model, this plan is really what that vision was, is having our community manage and, and rehouse families. This is that proposal, but, but it's now being done in the context of a housing recovery plan in response to COVID. Our goal is still to move to that community-based model um, in July of 2021 now. I know in the conversations in the house, there was conversation about amending our proposal and going to April 1st, we believe that this really sets us up well if we can implement this plan and rehouse many of these households to make that transition to that proposal that much smoother and easier because we will be providing a surge of resources to our community partners to do this work now and instead of when we transition to that proposed uh, community investment proposal. Gotcha, and as, as you said, I'll just confirm, um, this includes funding for service, the services component uh, for folks that are going to be housed in, in the projects that are going to be done around the state. Correct. Yes. Because okay. that's, that it really is vitally important. So, okay. Yes. Thank you. Yes. And, and I know that you can't look into the future, but I'm going to ask you to, how would you envision uh, being able to continue to fund that in the future? Uh, and by future, I mean two, three years out, because this um, this program will need to operate until we have ended homeless homelessness. And I, I would hope that I, that would actually occur. But I understand that, that there will always be circumstances and instant incidences where someone's going to stumble into it. So, yeah, I would say. Uh, um... You know, some of the, the feedback we had received from our partners, and I think your committee heard it, that there was two concerns with our, our proposal, original proposal in the SFY21 budget. One was the timing that they needed a little more time. And, uh, and the other was that they felt like more money was needed up front to, to, to really implement it. Yep. And I think this proposal get, provides that time and provides a significant level of resources to really do a lot of that work on the front end with, with the understanding that the funds that we were gonna provide under our community investment then um, really are able to do the work that we need them to do because we've surged so much of that work in the front end in the next year to, to, to really rehouse so many of the homeless households in the state and to keep them housed. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Sean. Um, any other questions for the department, um, um, Anne is here representing the 11 members that signed up. 
Okay, thank you. Thank you for joining us. And Sarah, the spreadsheet really made this uh, very clear. And uh, Sean, you filled in details earlier. And, and so thank you for this thoughtful work. We really appreciate it. And, and Ken, I'm not sure if we'll see you before um, this committee again, because you're leaving on the 31st. Is that correct? Actually, uh, June 26 is my last day, a week from tomorrow. Well, that's, that's even sooner. So. Uh, anything you want to share with us about anything exciting you're doing, or are you just um, free floating? <laughs> I am really looking forward to retiring. I'm looking forward to rest and relaxation. It has been a challenging time. And so who knows what the future will bring. Uh, but I am definitely looking forward to one of the advantages of COVID is that I will be focusing my travel within the state of Vermont for uh, the next couple of months. So I'm actually greatly looking forward to that. Uh, Representative Iacovoni has uh, made a, a good point that it might be time to look to the 251 Club and uh, I appreciated that suggestion. And look again, I- Come to Virgin. Come to Virgin's. <laughs> I'm doing the 251 Club as soon as this budgeting stuff is done. Yeah. <laughs> I started taking pictures of uh, these obscure little towns I've gone through that I might miss on my next journey through. So I've do started documenting them. That's great. Well, for the rest of the committee, as I told Representative Toll, my first excursion will actually be to Danville because my daughter um, has uh, gotten a puppy uh, from uh, a farm in Danville. And so we're going to go up there uh, June 27th. So I'm looking forward to that. <laughs> That's great. I thought you... I thought you could only get kitties in Danville. Oh. <laughs> we, you know, oh, it's bad. We have so much going on up here, Bob. There's almost anything you want. <laughs> Ken, um, best of best wishes to you and, and enjoy your retirement and, and enjoy some much deserved time off. You certainly have earned it. Thank and you very much. Good luck to you as, as you. Um, uh, take up the helm of, of this, the helm of this, uh, this department. You, you Thank know. you. I look forward to continuing our work with the Appropriations Committee. Yeah, there's lots of challenges and we look forward to working with you when, when a challenging budget comes into us. Yeah. In August. Okay, so uh, we are going to move uh, on and uh, Diane. Uh, yep. Yes, you, Madam Chair, I'd like to make a motion if you're ready. I think I'm ready to entertain a motion. I'd like to report to make a motion to report favorably on the amendment to H966 presented by Representative Pugh and all. And, and is there a second? I second. Okay, we have the motion made by Di, uh, by Representative Lamfer and seconded by Representative Jessups. Is are there any further comments or questions or clarification that committee members? need at this point. If not, uh, the clerk shall call the roll. Thank you, am I? Yeah. Representative Conquest. Yes. Representative Fagan. Yes. Representative Feltis. Yes. Representative Helm. E yes. Representative Hooper. Yes. Representative Jessup. Yes. Representative Lanfer. Yes. Representative Myers. Yes. Representative Townsend. Yes. Representative Iacovoni. Yes. Representative Toll. Yes. That is an 11 0. On this. And a very nice work to your committee. Uh, thank you. And uh, please thank the other 10 members. Uh, we appreciate um, the work that you have done to stabilize housing for uh, families across Vermont. Thank you very much. And um, thank you for loaning um, Representative Jessup to us to help do it. And we're hoping to continue this practice during the three quarter bill in August that as much as we communicate this way and work together, it just seems to, um, since we only have a couple of weeks in August to get a whole budget out, uh, mm -hmm. Hoping that this kind of communication uh, can continue. Absolutely. Um, if you do not need me anymore, best of luck on the rest of your deliberations. We always need you, Ann. If I were you, I'd jump off. <laughs> <laughs> Quickly. <laughs> thank you, Ann. Thank you. Sean, thank you. 
Okay, uh, so we were able to take DCF housing off the, the list of things to get done before the end of day tomorrow. Um, Chip and whatever group jumped off, do you have any uh, update on if language is needed? And if so, what would it be and who's drafting it? Um, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, I, no, we Just haven't. Before you, go, haven't. before you go, Linda had her hand up. I'm sorry, Linda. That's okay. He can, he can go and then I will. Okay. Um, we have, the group has not had a chance to meet yet. Um, as a matter of fact, maybe we can use this moment to schedule time. Uh, but I have talked to Carolyn. She's aware of the two issues that we're discussing. Um, and I'll save any more for our group okay. meeting, little group meeting. Okay, I think that um, right now uh, we have time as a committee that, that we can meet and discuss this. I just wanted to make sure that we, um, that we that we able we're able to do this amendment and get um, the amendment ready for the floor tomorrow. So, uh, Linda, before we go back to this, yeah, um, commerce is putting everything together. David Hall brought up the issue about uh, double dipping. Can you get money from one COVID pot and then apply to another one? And he's trying to come up with some language. And he's, they asked if I would come to appropriations to the committee and ask what we had thoughts on that. Well, our, our thoughts are scattered and we need to, <laughs> it, it's, a, it's really, it's a difficult issue uh, and we need to resolve it. And, and so um, I think that we need to open that up just to committee discussion at this, at this point. But before we do that, I just want to tell you the time frame of what we're doing tomorrow. Uh, Teresa, if you could jump on. We're meeting at 8.30, and right at 8.30, we're going to have uh, Mike Marcotte and his committee doing the economic development proposal. Is that correct? That's correct. And then at 9.15, you have S349, the municipal bill. And I just sent everybody an additional amendment to H961 that Stephanie just sent. What's 961? Is that the quarter bill? Yep. Dave? Uh, I was just explaining what 961 was. Sorry. Okay. Um, so um, Stephanie sent, what was it just? I didn't open it yet. I just sent it to everybody. It's an amendment uh, to the quarter bill. Senator Ash and Sears floor amendment. Hmm. And what does it say? Uh, let's see. Well, here, I'll put it up. How's that? Put it up. Okay. Yeah. There we go. Okay. Um, okay, so this is work that they're asking for um, to come Did to. Did this pass? No, it hasn't passed yet. What they're asking for um, is to present a plan to the General Assembly by August 18th that will create capacity for each state police barrack to have embedded mental mm -hmm. permissions from a designated agency or contract provider to more appropriately respond to situations involving individuals. And you guys can read this. I don't need to read it out loud to you. This plan, the commissioner shall review the embedded mental health clinician models developed in Franklin County for statewide scalability. The commissioner of public safety shall recommend the allocation of funds for this purpose and explore potential Medicaid uh, match. Um, in, in, in fairness, and, um, and I have to tell you, um, I want to see all of you here. I dropped the ball a bit, a, a bit on this. Senator Ash did um, send to me a um, for an amendment to put this in place actually has happened in the quarter year bill. And I told them it would be very difficult at this time for our committee to take on um, something without testimony to understand and asked him if there could be a plan put in place so that we could consider it in August when we come back for the larger bill. So it wasn't sprung on us without, um, without um, uh, any notice. I just, our committee could not take a concrete position on it to include right now at this time that it's something that we would need to do in August. So I, 
at this point, I'm sorry, I did not get that to you. I just, I had not seen the final language. And um, at this point, does anybody, would anyone want to take it on right now for the quarter year bill? I think we'd have to have testimony and we would have an awful lot of questions exactly what this means and the impact. Um, Mary. Um, are you talking about taking on actually adding these people in or are you saying, asking about this proposed amendment? This is just an analysis. Right, and, and, and what, what was asked for earlier was more to happen. And I, I didn't, I, I felt that we couldn't take it up this time and do it to justice. Um, or do due diligence and, and justice to the proposal. And so I sent back to uh, Senator Ash, can we please address yeah. it in August? And this is what's coming to us. I, Kitty, I think that is an excellent call. I really appreciate you doing that. Um, we could not have taken a position on adding it now without understanding the across the board implications of that. So. It'll be great they're sending us this information and we'll know what our other budgets are looking at and kind of what the consequence of doing this versus other things is. So it makes sense to handle it this way. Thank you, Mary. Uh, Maida. Uh, just wanting to be clear. So the Senate um, added this today before third reading. This was approved and added into 961. Um, has it been, has Teresa, has the, um, I'm not following the Senate actions. Has the Senate actually um, voted on this and put it into 961 and voted out? Do you happen to know? I, I you shouldn't, I know you're I, not able to follow I this. I believe um, Stephanie said it was going to the Senate floor. Right. I don't think it's already been So I think they're on it. Yes. Afternoon. Yeah, that's correct. So if we have great opposition to this, I can I can jump on and say, don't add to the quarter one bill. Um, what I did have opposition to was putting something much larger into action quarter one bill. I thought it needed more time. And mm -hmm. I apologize, I did not bring it to your attention until I just I hadn't seen this piece, but I- I, I, I just wanted to say, I personally think that if they, if the Senate it is indeed putting it in, as Mary was saying, it doesn't mandate anything other than an analysis, which is a key piece to making decisions. So thank you. Thank you. Okay. okay. Thank you, Maida. Mary? Uh, just as a reminder, in the budget that we had way back when and before this time, there was a proposal to, to put one more police social worker in the barracks that would have brought it up to either three or four, maybe to three. And there was also a proposal to create a police social worker in a couple of communities in central Vermont that will be nameless. Mm -hmm. And um, those were both ideas that we had supported um, way back when. So this is all in keeping with something we've been interested in, as has the Committee of Jurisdiction. They, they supported it also. And so Maida, I would believe this it, is- it, it, if, I, if I could add, and that the, Depart the Department of Public Safety has been interested in also. It, it's not as if this was something that was kind of you know, forced upon them. They welcome this at least had in the past. And so Maida, I would believe this would be with you to follow up, uh, or I'm trying to think of the committee of jurisdiction, would this be within, um, it would be across the hall. It, it really covers a couple of jurisdictions here uh, yeah. and, and uh, healthcare. And so, gov government operations also. Okay, so if uh, Chip could just make judiciary aware of it, Maida, you make government operations aware of it, and Mary, you make um, uh, healthcare aware of it, then, then nobody will be surprised on the floor. And at least the committees of jurisdiction will, will know that um, we thought this language was a good addition. So on a straw poll, um, how many of you would support uh, this additional language um, as 
you know, it's more fact finding. Thank you. Uh, great. And so that will put us, uh, we'll look for this information when we return in August. Okay, now we're going to go back to um, the uh, economic development bill that's coming in at 8.30. Teresa, have we also scheduled Representative Coburn to come in? I know she's going to testify. I was trying to nudge you during the meeting and you had 16 other things going on. <laughs> I actually, if you look at your phone right now in the text, it has a summary. So Representative Colburn is going to House Commerce this afternoon. She's presenting the amendment and they are anticipating incorporating it into what they are bringing to you in the morning. And I offered for Representative Colburn to come in with them in case there was any questions. So they have agreed to the amendment? It sounds like they have, or they're, they've worked it out. That's so what it sounded like. <laughs> so is it different than the original amendment? I don't know. That's all I know. But so there, is an email, there is an email that you could um, so I like to. Who's listening to <laughs> I don't know what. We can look at. Uh, I, no, I, like I don't have anything. I would like to see the amendment. Um, I did have some concerns with the amendment. I certainly understand the thoughtfulness behind it, but it would mean almost every hospital would not be eligible for a grant the way I it was originally written. Seen it. Yeah, Mary, Katie, do you see it? Uh, yeah. Well, I don't see the actual amendment. I'm looking at an email that says she's changed it to a ratio of 20 to one the highest paid worker could, could that means the, that at a firm where the lowest paid is earning the minimum wage, the highest paid worker could earn over 500,000 before the eligibility criteria would kick in. So it takes, by moving it from 10 to 20 to one, it doesn't limit it as drastically. As it did. I just it. would. I would just like a thoughtful analysis of what this means in every. You know. You know. In a yeah, it's a little email. confusing because the way she wrote in her email was that she was offering it at third reading, and um, that was not what I got from somebody else. So I think okay. you're right that it's an amendment okay. in third reading. Yeah, until we know, uh, we're just guessing. So we we need yeah. to put that out, and then we a position but i have offered for her to come into the meeting in the morning mm -hmm. with okay uh, and i and i would like our committee to take a position if, if it's appropriate okay uh peter needs to leave for another meeting um and so then at nine uh we only have 45 minutes tomorrow for that economic development bill linda are you seeing any hiccups there or uh you've been following it and letting us know i gotta unmute you linda there you go well Linda, you're muted. She'll have to do it herself, probably. Linda, can you unmute yep. yourself? The hiccup, the hiccup, right? The last few um, uh, issues was where David was going. David Hall was going to put them together. <laughs> the hiccup was the issue of double dipping, and that was the question that I was bringing back. But we can discuss that tomorrow when they come in, if you want to, or if you want me to convey what our thoughts are right now. Well, we have this discussion because it came up in the ag bill as well. Okay. And, um, and so, uh, Chip, you were um, you had some thoughts, and then the group was going to break out, but then the breakout didn't quite work. Um, so, my question is, Chip, is this something that you would like the whole committee to discuss now, or uh, should this be like a committee of three or four that work on it? It certainly would not be a majority of members. Um, so. Sorry, my phone's ringing. Um, uh, I, I think the committee, I mean, I, I think if, a th if three or four of us break out, we're gonna have to bring it back to the committee anyway. So um, if we have time, it might make sense to just do it as a whole committee right now. Okay, um, so as it relates to Linda's. Um, oh, bye all, I have to leave. Bye, bye, Peter. We won't make a decision. In, um, so um, what I'm asking, I, I need some clarification because there's 
there's several CRF bills out there and I don't see any, I have Maria here. I don't see anyone from legislative council. And I know Mike was working on this and other legislative lawyers were too. Um, it, the intent, there's different intent in different bills. And I'm not sure that there needs to be consistency because each bill has, has its own, um, you know, it, they're, they're just not exact templates that we can move from one to the next. And, and so what is it, um, we've had double dipping clauses um, in other bills to take care of that. What is it that needs to be addressed differently in agriculture that the double dipping clause does not cover? That's my question. Uh, Diane, are you answering my question, I hope? I hope, I don't know, I'm gonna, we're, I, uh, so Madam Chair, in earlier discussions, you know, I do, I forgot, and I did relay this to Representative Conquest, that this particular bill in the ag sector, it's got an automatic, I forgot that they're automatic, it's not an application or a grant process that, that, that what they're proposing is that X amount of dollars go out in this manner to everybody, with no ac application. So that was changing my thinking a little. So I just wrote to the group, and this is for Food for Thought, or was that if an entity chooses the automatic payment, then then they they can no longer further apply to the ACCD economic uh, grants. They might be able to apply for other things that, that we've got out there, but not through those economic doors. But if they choose to not accept the automatic payment, then they can apply for the ACCD, which could be a larger in size single support. And then I would say that any of the money left in this, in these rounds then comes back to the bottom line of uh, CRF. But the bottom line or the difference is, is that, I forgot that this is an automatic. So if it's mm -hmm. automatic, I think we can say, you can take the automatic, but give them the choice, or you can say, no, thank you. I would rather apply. So the automatic is only, it's not for the entire bill, it's for certain pieces of the bill. So it's for the entire bill that I see, and I could be wrong. It's for the dairy, dairy producers, cheese producers. I don't know about the forest. The non, but not the non, not the non-dairy oh. uh, piece. So that That's piece. True. So that okay. wouldn't apply to them. Right. It would only apply to the piece that. Um, that are automatic. Okay. So, uh, in the chip and it's, it's not, it's not. It's not automatic. I mean, you have to apply and, and indicate your economic harm, the loss that you've had. I mean, it's not like we're just sending payments to dairy farmers okay. regardless. Um, they, they, you know, as the bill's written, I don't, I mean, I think if you apply and, and um, meet the administrative requirements, then you'll, then you will get a payment, but it's not, uh, anyway, I okay. Just, yeah. Not so then, but, yeah. Then for me, then it's like you can either take that one or you can take, you can apply the other one too. I don't. Yeah. The automatic part is. I guess it's the amount that's automatic. Up to. No, it, it's an up to amount. So it's not an automatic payment of X dollars. It's an up okay. to based on the information that you put in. The the difference between this and and the economic development, this is specifically for dairy and forestry, yeah. where the others are, are broader. Um, Mary, and then Marty, and then Linda. I, I may have misled you, and I apologize for that. I didn't mean to. I have a question for Linda. Did, do, can you tell us, was there a discussion of what the grant payments may have are likely to be for the commerce people, kind of what magnitude they are? Uh, I actually can't tell you that, but here's, here's why it came up originally. It was um, Ellen Kelher from the Vermont Sustainable Job Funds, and it was uh, $5 million to working lands funds, and she wanted them to say, that the board shall not provide awards to businesses in the dairy sector for the same documented 19 that. related economics. Well, once that came up, 
then the committee yeah. started talking about all the various different ones. We, especially they were talking about the creative arts. So if they applied to one and then there was another place that they could go to, could they then also, and, and if they got it on their first application, could they then go to someplace else within that whole creative arts thing? So now they're looking at all of them. Yeah, the, the reason I asked about the amount was when I look at the amounts that are, thank you for the reminder that it's up to, they are pretty significant grant amounts compared to what I believe in the dairy sector, Okay. compared to what I believe is happening in the commerce bill. And that was the reason I was asking um, so businesses who would, who are not eligible for the dairy money, um, you know, restaurants and those retailers who have experienced 75% of loss, what I'm hearing is a concern that they'll get maybe, um, a thousand dollars or $2,000 as opposed to a more substantial amount on the dairy side. Um, and that's what I was just trying to find a comparability sort of thing. Yeah, and, the, and, and, and you know, I, I'm not, I haven't been there enough to get this specific grants. I have what they have, but they, the, the amounts that are going to each the sections do not seem to me overly, uh, opulent, I guess is the word I would use. So the ability, the, the issue should come up that, you know, if, if someone gets $2,000 and they find another ve venue to go through, can they also apply to that one? And, and I guess our, the, the Commerce Ledge Council has a concern about how he needs to convey that. Mary, have you have a follow? Are you do you have a follow up or? No, not. I mean, if Chip, do you know how much in grants a dairy producer in each category is likely to receive? Are there some who are only going to get a thousand or two as opposed to the 14 or 15 at the top end? Um, so I can't, I, I can't say that I've heard testimony about that. Um, I, I'm sure their testimony has been given and I'm, I don't know what it is. My, my gut is that dairy farmers, dairy, you know, the fluid milk dairy farmers are the majority are likely to um, have suffered enough loss that they might be near the cap um, of, of uh, the, the, the up to amount, the, the cap in, in awards. I think it's different for dairy processors because they vary in size to a fair degree. Um, and so dairy processors might not reach the reach the caps. The caps for the dairy farms range from um, 42, $42,500 to $110,000 for the largest farms. If, if you just... Uh, yeah, you know what? I, I, I take that back. I mean... 14000 uh, Because I'm not looking at the most recent I, bill. Yeah. So um, I may have that wrong. I can get it, but... If you just do the math, and I, I just divided 700 into 20 million, and I was getting that on average, and I know it's not an average because people get different sizes, of, of different grant amounts, but each one would get $28,500. I can tell on, you what the bill says if it would be helpful. Okay, that would be. Yeah, the, the latest bill we have, and it's on for those, it's the bill that came over from the Senate. It's uh, yeah. 14,500 for small farms. Uh, I lost my place, I'm sorry. Um, medium sized farms, excuse me, small farms up to 14,500. 
um, medium size, 55,000 and large, 100,000. And then there's definitions. Yeah. But if you just do the kind of gross math, and if the new number is 25 million, and if there there's a, is- There's a chunk of that going out to processors though, to cheese makers. And so it's not just to the dairy farmers. So okay, but, but that sector, just okay. generally what we're saying, we're going to give to that sector. Is 20 million. Yeah. Well, no, or maybe more than that. I mean, they're talking about raising that um, to maybe 25 million. Um, and just do the math. How many farmers are there? If there are 1,400 farmers to, to get that whole sector, then you're talking about a $17,000 grant. No, no, because you have to go all the cheese processors. And if you, what's the number of cheese processors and people in the state? Uh, because five million of that go to processors, the yogurt makers, the cheese makers, and and I don't know that number. And okay, so, then go back to my original. How many dairy producers are there? I think they're about seven hundred. No, there's about uh, well, we lost fourteen in May, so there's in the neighborhood of 640. Yeah. So 640 divided into $20 million. No. And right, the way this it's 20 million to them up, and it's 3.8 to producers because yeah. it's a total of 22.8 in the Senate bill for ag, 22.8. 19 million something for the dairy and 3.8 for the processors. I so it is 640 divided by 20 million. Okay, which the, the way which the program is Mary set is up. making is is about the big picture, right? We're not yeah. talking. It doesn't matter if we're talking about whether they get twenty thousand or. Yeah. You know, right. the, the difference in the numbers isn't really important here. The discussion is about whether or not grants on this scale should be given in the dairy industry as opposed to elsewhere. I I will just point out that that some dairy farms are losing $30,000 every time they get a check in their, for their milk. So the scale of their loss is also different than the scale of their, than of, mm -hmm. of um, grants in other sectors. So um, in the commerce bill, yeah. There is there is uh, language about double bit dipping, and there's also language that I do believe that they have to attest somehow. They have to submit documentation that they're not double dipping. Do we do the same thing with the dairy and, and just follow the same uh, That's language? A lot of money. Commerce bill. Well, the the commerce bill doesn't have this in yet. They're asking us what we're. They're asking my our committee as to what we think about the issue of double dipping and should they then consider that and their l reduced funds that are gonna be going out. Well, I would assume that within uh, the agency with the number of farmers that they have that we could demand the double dipping but not just on the honor system that they don't do it but they have to provide documentation uh, of did, you know, if they received other grants and that they're not applying double money uh, to one expense. But um, I, we had some other hands up. I needed to get, um, Linda, you were responding, but you had your hand up and Marty's had hers up. Did you um, have something additional? That, and Dave is also, and then back to Mary. Linda, did you? No, let Marty go. It's all okay. right. Marty? I took my hand down. Oh, thank you. I didn't notice. Well, I I wanted to ask Linda what the total amount is that you're comp you're considering in this second budget, the second commerce bill, and are you dividing it up by sectors or is it just broad like before? And what's the eligibility? Are you saying economic harm of a certain percentage? No, what they're talking. Oops, am I on? Yes. So what they're yes right. That right now they're talking about it looks like fifty nine million dollars for for uh, co the this commerce bill, um, and they're they're talking about five million of it is like going to the 
Arts Council for, for mm -hmm. the, the creative arts community. And there will be similar amounts for the various different sections of, of, of the businesses. So they're, they're saying, can, let's, let's look at the Vermont Symphony Orchestra. Can they get their, their benefit out of that five, million, that five million from the Arts Council? But then is there another way, for instance, and they were looking at the, the especially the ones that, that drew large crowds of people that they were losing that that amount of money from large crowds of people did would we be be agreeable to allowing them or telling them and they were asking me are we doing it with all the other caches of money that we have through here but, but are they sick? Are they signaling out separate groups like the creative arts is one and they're doing five million for some other group and five million for some other group? They are doing five million for creative the creative arts is for the for the arts uh, outs. And I have the bill in front of me. Uh, is working five million for working lands. Um, Five million to the Vermont Community Loan Fund uh, for women-owned uh, grants for women-owned businesses uh, and minority-owned businesses. But again, they're ten thousand dollars and of those. And so that's how it's going through right now. They are Department of Tourism and Marketing three million fourteen one point four million for. Uh, OCC of uh, the Office of Economic Opportunity uh, for, to provide grant community action grants of not more than five thousand dollars to provide technical assistance because they're offering technical assistance. It's just going on and on and on. So, yeah. you know, unless well, I, I, I'm supposed to go back there at some point in time, they're they're sitting around waiting for David to come up with some language. And they're going to let me know, and I'm going to go back to them to see what we might have thought about this. Um, we may be. Well, oh, go ahead, Marty. Well, I was just going to comment. I think it's unfortunate that they have broken it all up by sectors as opposed to just leaving it wide open and say anybody that's thought, you know, 50% loss of income or something like that because then we could have this definition of economic harm and you either use your economic harm problem in the dairy industry or you use it in the big broad ACC area, but that's not the way they're going. And so it looks like we've got 12 different buckets out there that people could choose from. And then well, we have the problem of you're gonna have to stay within your own bucket. Well, I will tell you that they, you know, had originally said that they weren't going to divide it up into to, to sections. It was going to be kind of here's the money, and now all of a sudden, they, this whole issue of the creative economy is what they're referring to in terms of the arts has come up, and they want to give this money to the arts council for that. So, so uh, Linda, out of the, out of the the larger. Uh, out of the larger amount, has most of it been identified or is the larger amount still a chunk to go out to businesses? Um, there's still a larger chunk that's going out to businesses, okay? The five million right now is for the, uh, the creative economy, but then there's 59 million in now for all of the other businesses that would be coming to them for money. Okay, so the, seven, other. The, the 75 went out to all the larger group and another 59, 60 is easier for my math, yeah. um, is to the larger group. And then, and then there has been, um, so 86, so about uh, 21 million has been identified in smaller chunks. Right. Now there is, again, is there's that 5 million for the working lands funds in addition. So that's why it brought the number down to 59 million. 
Okay. Thank Can you. I ask Linda a question? Yes. Go so ahead. A couple of things, because in the quarter budget, or was in the BAA, didn't we put a significant amount of money in for working lands from the CRF fund? We put one million dollars in. Not close enough. Okay. Well, that's good. That's good. Uh, and then my other question is the Arts Council, which is much, um, the uh, the direct. I, I don't know which. It, I think it was like the the Corvell number two budget that went out that went directly. Vermont got about four hundred or half a million dollars to just go directly out to arts. That well, came in and went out like quick. Yes, Did the that's committee already take, done. Right, it's already gone. I was just wondering if the committee took into consideration that if, if you got that, can you not apply for this is another issue because that would be another COVID dollar support that they've already re they've already went through that application process. That, that was in tier one, right? Yeah. Yeah. No, well, no, it was, it was, uh, it was direct. They never it came was different. It was different money that yeah. came into the state. It wasn't right. part of the 1.25. It was there uh, that whole spreadsheet that I call it the Leahy spreadsheet yeah. that he, you know, that they had brought us very early on that was going out directly. Okay. Okay. I'm going to move to Dave. You've had your okay. hand a while and then I'll be back to um, Nada and then back up to you, Mary. Thank you. I have a couple of thoughts. Um, my understanding is the overall pot of funds that we're dealing here are, are uh, stimulus funds. And if I'm correct, that what the guiding principle should be, will these dollars stimulate anything? Where I'm headed to on this is the sustainability question. I've been speed reading the 24 page ag bill, so I may have missed it, although I've read it twice, but um, it, it speaks of harm. Demonstrate your harm, you're eligible for some help, and uh, depending on the amount of your size. But the, yet just yesterday, and you might remember the question on the floor from one of the members, um, I think from Springfield, and Representative Donnie, you and I both said the same thing. It, you have to be able to demonstrate you're sustainable. So why would we, for an adult day or a nursing home or a home health agency, say, I'm sorry, you're not getting any help because it's clear you're not sustainable. But yet in another sector where I don't see that it has to be sustainable. Now, I would be willing to let someone double or triple dip uh, all they could with different applications as long as they, had, they could show some sustainability. If not, I don't think we're stimulating anything. We're giving somebody uh, money, it might be half a loaf here, and they pay some bills, which is very important to them. But I'm not sure we're stimulating the economy if they go under. Having said that, while I am a champion of working lands and agriculture and appreciate the impact on agritourism, um, maybe our ag industry is in such dire straits that it's not about sustaining, it's a lifeline and hoping something additional comes along later. It could be that bad. Chip and others know a lot more than I do about it. So I was trying to offer something, I was trying to say, um, yes to the dipping, um, but there ought to be a question of sustainability. We've done it on healthcare. Why wouldn't we do it on others? And I don't know if there's a draft person in the uh, Hollywood squares here today, but I can't see um, them, but um, it may already be in the bill. And if so, I apologize. The double so dip, Dave, I look at as two different things and maybe we need to clarify what the committee considers double dipping. I'm thinking of double dipping as I'm getting money from two different pots to pay the same bill or to help, you know, I, patchworking is different to me than double dipping that I have, I have $10 and I can get 250 here and I can get 250 there. But if I can get 10 from you and 10 somewhere else, that's double dipping to me and you can't pay the same bill twice. But if I have $10 in need, it's just like going to college. I'm going to apply for every grant that I can get to patchwork mm -hmm. together. And so I think our committee first has to decide, is it okay to patchwork? I mean, part of this, you know, there is this honor system, but then how do we, how do we do, um, there's going to be an auditing system. So anyone who takes this money takes it under, you know, we need to put it in there that you have to spend it as you're saying you're going to, and you, and you can't, obviously if it's already been paid for 
under penalties of perjury, you're, um, you know, you, you can't pay for the same bill twice and, and get away with that. But is there some kind of mechanism where um, entities that, if, if we think patchworking is okay, that they have to attest that these are the needs and that they're putting this money solely to that need and it's not being covered by something else? Thank you for that clarification, Kitty. Well, and I'm kind of asking a question too. I get it. And yeah. I would agree with what you said. Let them do all the patching they can, but we don't want to pay them twice for the same bill. Um, At least. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry, I no. didn't mean to cut you off. No, 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 I'm, I'm done, I'm sorry. Um, um, Maida. Looking right at you, and okay. I couldn't come out with you. Okay. I didn't know you were looking right at me. Okay, so following right along on that, because I've been sitting here feeling very simple-minded and didn't know if it was worth offering. What? Why can't it be going along with this patchworking concept? Why can't it be that if an entity has has received uh, CRF money through one of the mechanisms that we're putting out there? but it comes nowhere near dealing with all of the harm that they've suffered they may, when they, tr that they make uh, application, because everybody's gotta be applying for these grants and all. When they make the application, part of what has to be listed is, we got X amount um, in CRF already for X, Y, and Z purposes. And here's why we need additional and why we're making the application from this other pot within the CRF. I, I don't know if that's useful or not, I, but it seems to me it could work. What are, well, let me get back to um, Mary and then Kimberly. Dave, is your hand back up? Um, just, I just want to make sure I get back to people. So Mary and Kimberly. So I'm in the get or done mode. I believe that the parameters of the ag bill are more or less set. I, I, I think it would probably be very hard to go back in now and deal with the sustainability and are there other ways to allocate this out, even though that, and I say that having begun there and wanting to do that. The reason I was reflecting on Kind of what the average amount of a grant could be there is because it strikes me that compared with other opportunities, it's pretty substantial, particularly with the way the program's written, which is if there's still money left in the pot, you can reapply. And other folks don't have that, you know, in the other grant programs that are being set up. So I would leave that alone, the general framework, notwithstanding how much I like the sustainability notion. But I would say you are, if you choose to be in that program and to receive those grants, then you cannot come over and receive the grants that for which you may be eligible in the others, perhaps for the time being. So leave the ag people in the ag pot and keep the other pot free for other people. And then in the other pot, the commerce pot, we can have the, the patchwork double dipping conversation. But let's just separate out the two and, and say, if you choose to participate on the ag side, at least for the time being, you may not come over here and participate in the commerce bill side, because you got your own special bill. Um, one of the things we need to pay attention to, is this money needs to get out the door and we cannot make this a really complicated process or slow people down while they try to sort, should I do this or should I do that? We need to keep it simple. And so that's, that's my thought for the moment. Can I ask a clarifying question of Mary just about that? Sure. What, do you, when you say you can't come over, let's say in the commerce pot, do you mean in order to address your milk income losses or do you mean for anything? 
well, not knowing or understanding the ag world, uh, my inclination is to say for most anything. Um, out of the commerce pot, I guess, I presume, and I'm, so I'm not talking about the other federal programs like the payroll protection and all of that, which, you know, it's not our job to think about. But at least for the time being, we may want to realize that we're just trying to push this out and we're going to be here, God help us, in six weeks when we can rethink the whole thing, when we see how everything has worked and has it worked or not. And the, at which point we may know that we, you know, we're not succeeding on the ag side and we may need to grant more money there or that there's too much money in the cultural side. I, you know, we can reevaluate in September. I'll wait my August. turn to respond. I didn't hear you. I just said, I'll wait my turn to respond to that. I okay. kind of jumped in there. Okay, I need, uh, I have Kimberly that has been waiting and then Diane. Yeah. Um, I came in a tad late because I was in human services, but I heard that there are no carve outs for this second piece of commerce, Linda. But the question I have is, has the criteria shifted? What is the criteria, even if there are carve outs or there aren't carve outs? Well, the, as I see it right now, there, there are carve outs. I mean, in a sense. Because if you're telling the creative economy that they're, you're giving them $5 million, that's a carve out, right? It goes to the Arts Council, which then distributes the money. In this, in also in the bill, they're giving the Vermont Sustainable Job Funds wants $5 million to go to working lands funds. That's another carve out. Right. Can, can I just pause for a minute? I do understand that there are the carve outs. My question is for the piece that's remaining after the carve outs, do we have solid criteria? I haven't heard them say anything about that specific criteria. Is it still the 50% loss, Linda? The Pardon first, me? is it still that they, they have to have achieved 50% loss? Is yes. that okay? Kimberly, where, did you have a follow-up? Yeah, so the answer is for the for the pot that is, so to speak, outside the carve-outs, it's a 50% loss. Right, okay, thank you. Uh, let's see, my, my screen jumps around so I know where my last hand was, but I think, uh, Diane, you're up and then Chip. So I know I know that we're wrestling with and we need to, we need to get things done and I agree that we need to get the money out fast and, and all of that. What, what I'm wrestling with right now is the differential in the amount of money for it just in the amount of money. We've got tens of thousands of businesses with a pot that's like down to 50 million. And, and then we've got 640 that, that have 20 million. I'm, that's where I'm really wrestling with is the disproportionate, not because there's not need and people have lost, but it just seems a little less, um, equitable um, with, with the dollars that we have, you know? And I know that we're not gonna be able to totally change any yeah. of that, but um, I, I, if you're gonna be a part of the bigger pot, then I don't think you can, there's tens of thousands of businesses on this side, but I wanna take, make sure that I can take eggs piece into to mind. So what is our job? What is our job here in this committee is to, balance it. Our, our, right. Our, our job is to also, um, I, I think our job is to also make sure it's a process that's easy, but it's a process that's not taken advantage of as well. Yeah. Um, Chip. Um, so uh, it's a good conversation. I appreciate it. And I, I appreciate all the points that Mary made. Um, and I'm only going to disagree on the sort of the last, last little decision point there. Um, I would I would remind us that that Vermonters as a whole and dairy farmers are no different. Dairy farm families tend to tend to have lots of different things they do in order to make a living, right? I mean, 
I, I think that's something that people have recognized about the life here in Vermont, and, and it's true, just as true, maybe more so, but at least as much for dairy farm families that they that they have a number of different enterprises that they do to try to make um, make a, a living as a whole, or, or some people work off the farm and some on the farm. To me, that that recognition makes me want to say, absolutely, I agree that if you're getting support for your loss of income in your fluid milk um, check, that you, and we have a program for that, you shouldn't go over to some other uh, program that's in the commerce bill in order to get help making up that loss in your fluid milk. But if I think it was Marty or somebody else brought up, you know, if one of the things that your family needs to do is to have a rental property where you fixed up the house on your farmland and, and renting it out as part of your income, and now you have rental arrearages, if there's a program to address that, I think that you ought to be able to take advantage of that. It seems to me that those are separated enough that, that to my mind, that makes sense to allow people to take advantage of sort of one program in each of those sectors of their family's livelihood, if that's what they need to do. Um, I, I, you know, I think to me, it's always worth remembering that the scale of the loss for dairy, while, while compared to businesses as a whole in Vermont may not be that different, but each one of them is just more money goes through and, and out of those dairy farms than in almost any other business in, in Vermont. So people are losing on the neighborhood of um, 30,000, 60,000 in some instances of, of lost income for every time they get a check. And so um, I don't, you know, I, I know that in that bill, it does say that if there's any money left over, it will revert. I can't imagine there's any money left left over. It's the, in the first two months for March and April, the losses were calculated to be $40 million. So I, it doesn't seem like that pot is going to go far enough to have any money left over, but I'm getting I'm getting down the road where I don't want to go. I, I, really, I'm just saying I think you ought to be able to be confined to one one program to make up for your losses in that area and not be able to go to commerce for more make up losses in that same area. But if you have a different part of your family's livelihood that you need help with and it's a different program, that you should be able to do that. Okay, I think a, a common theme here, though, that the two big programs are, you know, the commerce program and the, the, the dairy program. Um, and and um, would we would you put the forestry piece into within these two bills that if, if you take advantage of one, you don't go to the other. However, if you have another business entity or you qualify for something else that you are able to um, to apply for the rental assistance or uh, to public service for, um, you know, assistance on 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 your um, elect what, utility bills. Is that a common theme that that we are where that Mary you are saying that if you apply for one you don't apply for anything else. I I, I hear this and there's not enough to go around. I, I would lay bets that downtown state and main street businesses in Montpelier for the two hardest months of shutdown saw $40 million in losses. I, I can do that doing the calculation of what I know certain restaurants lost. And there, and so it's, it's the equity piece and they are just as much as the heart and soul, you know, our beautiful built environment is just as important as those working lands. And I, I'm, I'm struggling with the different access to money that is being experienced there. I'm, I, I'm just not resolved yet on that. Um, but I, I'll, I keep repeating the same thing and I need to stop and let other people talk. Uh, Marty. 
Thank you, Mary. Uh, Marty? I see in all the bills that we have passed or considered so far, we have carved out or attempted to carve out something for dairy, something for forestry, something for working lands, and something for health care, health, the health stabilization fund. And it seems to me that if we have carved out those four areas, and now maybe they want to carve out creative arts as well, that then you, 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 you try to recover your economic harm from the area in which you belong. And if you don't belong in any of those, which is restaurants and everybody else, you go to the general funds that are available under commerce. I could see that in addition, if, he, if somebody also had utility arrearages or they also had a rental problem, that they could apply under those because those are not based, they're not carved out by, by industry, they're carved out by a use. So my, my suggestion, and I don't know how we do it, <laughs> is that say if people have tried to recover their economic harm by going directly to either dairy, forestry, working lands, the health stabilization, or creative arts, that that's where they go. And that everybody else goes to the big pot that was the 70 million and this now 59 million, apparently. Okay, we're back on that theme. Um, Diane. <laughs> this is gonna, I'm, I'm with, gonna move into the meta camp of simplicity a little bit. And the expediency is we're talking about different entities that are all businesses. They're, they're all businesses in Vermont. And why isn't this just one bill? No. Why isn't it just a business or an economic development bill, which includes ag, that the money that it's not 59 and 20 and 13, you know, and I know the carve outs are important for these smaller groups, but it could be one bill where they just all apply to one place. They all have to apply now that it's not automatic and they all have to apply. Why isn't it not 50, 60, 70, 80, a hundred million dollars in a pot that says businesses, this is what you apply to do, except for like Marty had said with certain, certain areas you can go to first, which is like the, the arts or something. It's just really simplistic. Sorry. Thank you, Diane. And then we're going to go to Dave, and then we're going to find some resolution here. Uh, in the spirit of trying to offer a resolution, I, I'm going to try to build off what Marty said. Uh, propose a uh, categorical, uh, a categorical ap approach that that we have a, a needs-based categorical approach that people stay within their industry category with the exception for uh, any other side supports like rental or or utility diane you make a good point but i think we're past that i think we're too late that was the governor's proposal not being critical of him but it wouldn't have helped the state colleges it wouldn't have helped child care etc uh, and that's why people started to do some of these sector carve outs um, so in any event following what marty said um, we have industry categories. You stay within your, your category of industry, but you're eligible for any additional support that anyone else might be able to get from a benefit program. Um, Dave, I, I, you, do, you do bring up a, big, uh, a, a good question, and I don't want to compare or talk about the governor's program versus ours. But when we think about economic development, we have to remember you know, we chose to keep the state colleges going and that would have been a huge um, crush to many areas of the state had those yeah. uh, closed. And so, you know, the, the millions that we've been putting in there and our, and our commitment for bridge funding, that really is part of the economic development total. It's not totally sure. education. And, right. and there's other areas throughout if we, if we go through the other dollars that have already gone out the door. And as we said, our hospitals are huge economic engines, and not only are they a healthcare system, but they double as an economic 
you know, that was also economic recovery uh, by keeping those entities mm -hmm. sustainable. And, and so we, I don't want to get hung up on dollars at the end because sometimes dollars serve in, in two areas. Um, and, and so to, I, I went to your point somehow, but now I've spun out of your point. So it's, it sounds like there's a categorical approach here. Um, you know, and and I, I think Dave has a point about the trains already down the track and, and you know, Diane, you have a good point, but I think we've gone beyond at this point, um, knowing that we need to get these dollars out. And in, um, in, for the administration, for the Senate, and for at least members of the House, um, the dairy piece got carved out on all three sides, you know, on all in all three areas. And um, so now that the carve out is there, um, do we want to do a categorical approach where if you apply for, if you're a dairy farm and you apply for that grant, then you don't um, apply uh, in, the, in the grants that Mike Marcott, his committee is working on. That seems to be the theme that I keep hearing. And so I, I think at this point, um, if you want to keep working in that theme, I'd like to see a raise of hands because if we don't have a majority, we're not gonna go down that road. If you wanna keep going where we do some kind of categorical approach where then we'll decide if it's patchwork or not. But if, if you wanna do a categorical approach where if you, get, if you go for the arts or for dairy, you don't go for the commerce one. I'd raise your hand if you want to, to go down that approach. I, I think so, but I, I wanna make sure I understand that so if I apply in dairy and I, and I have a different business or my farm family has a different business, can they apply in? That's the next vote. That's the next vote. Okay. This is, this is just for the big economic development grants for your business. So I have one, two, three, four, five. I have five. Do I only one, two, three, four? You got to put your hands up longer. Don't take them down yet. One, two. Three, four, five, six, uh, seven, uh, eight. Okay, I, I think uh, some are some are real and some are blue. So uh, we have a majority vote there. So we're going to do something there. Now, my next question for the committee is: If you have applied for a grant, no matter who you are, um, as long as you don't double dip and pay the same bill twice or the same need twice, do you uh, feel that? If you are um, uh, an individual who received a grant for your small business, should you be able to, and you have apartment houses too, should you be able to apply for rental assistance for other programs? That's the example I'm going to use. Or if you apply for one thing, you don't apply for anything else. So yes, if you want to be able to do some patchworking to, uh, to meet your needs, and a no vote if you want one grant and one grant only. So if you agree with patchworking that if you have like two separate needs and you can go to multiple areas and you uh, and um, to get money as long as you don't pay the same bill twice, raise your hand if you agree with that path. Okay, good there. Okay, now, how do we write the language? That's where we need legislative counsel. Ah. <laughs> yep. I'm not writing it. Um, no. <laughs> so um, back to the one with dairy, are we including all the other sectors in there too? So if you apply, if you're an arts person, you have a choice. You can apply through the arts grant or you can apply through economic development, but you don't do it twice. Is that what we're agreeing mm -hmm. to? If you're a dairy person, I can either apply to my dairy program or the other one, but I can't do both. I'm Kimberly. I'm just um, I'm slightly hesitating because I'm thinking there must be businesses that I can't think of at this very second that don't fall neatly into a sector, and that's what's just giving me slight pause here. And they apply for the the the, the regular economic development grant. 
We're just right. singling out those few sectors that have been singled out. So, Bob. Madam Chair, whatever we do, however we do it, I guarantee you there'll be some crossovers or some bump into's and there will be some issues. So we yep. might as well admit to that, formulate what we feel is reasonably correct and go with it. Or we're gonna be talking about it right. for another week. Right, you know? we're not gonna no. be able to solve every problem. You're right. Exactly. Somebody, exactly. And somebody will figure out a way to you know, get around it. But I need a leg legislative council. We've never, who's our drafter, Maria? We've never- no. I'll try to get somebody. I just know that there's plenty of, there's a lot of people in House Commerce, I think, right now. So let me just see who's around. Actually, if we could talk to House Commerce, that would be really good. Can we merge in and maybe we could all do it? <laughs> yeah. I wish there was a way to do that. That would be great, wouldn't it? Merge two committee. I know. Mary okay. Hooper, thank you very well. Let me see what's going on over there and I'll get back to you in a minute. Because okay. the Dave, what, Dave, or can, can I ask, like, what are they looking at? I tried to find, Dave, the bill on their website. I see the amendment. You said 24 pages, but I found a 14-page bill. I'm looking. I don't have a draft of it. I, I don't. No, I'm looking on Commerce's page. Right. Right. And and they're they're doing a working draft right now, Diane. So anything you look don't at. Don't watch. Don't look please. at it. Yeah, Is that yeah. correct, Linda? That yeah. we don't, okay. Right. I have the 14 pager, but you're right. They're they're moving around. Mary, what what's our time frame? Do we have to vote this out tonight? Uh, no, we we have to, four. We have to have it ready to go tomorrow morning. Uh, tomorrow the, morning. The dairy bill we could we could do. That's going to move separately. So uh, the dairy and forestry bill could move out. Um, I'd like it tomorrow afternoon at the latest. Um, and uh, S349, uh, Meta will put a uh, proposal on the, on the table uh, tomorrow. Commerce is on a break. We can invite Mar Mike Marcotte to our committee. I just got a text. Um, Teresa, do you wanna do that to grab Mike and maybe we can resolve this right now with Mike. And Diane. Do that. Hang on one second and I'll send him the link. Yes. Diane, the bill I was looking at came to us in an email from Teresa Tuesday at 5.41 p.m., S-351, if you want to look at it, FYI. Oh, that's the ag bill. Yes, I've got that. Yeah. Yeah. I thought you okay. were looking at the commerce bill. No, no, I was looking at oh, ag. Okay. No number for that one yet. No, I looked at the ag bill. Yeah. Hey, hey, Bill, I'd like to get out Friday. If we can't get it out Friday, Monday is the drop dead done, but it because it's moving uh, in a separate bill. This is the big one that we have to move. And I'm looking for Mike Marcotte's number. And then, Teresa? What? Why, uh, did you find Mike Marcotte? Uh, I'm, I'm emailing him right now. Is that our biggest kitty? We have Commerce, Ag, Government Ops Quarter Bill. Yeah. Why don't we take a five minute break? Yeah, People let's do a break. A coffee and I'll try to find Mike. We'll come back in uh, about five or 10 minutes.